Section seventy of Curiosities of Literature, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume Two by Isaac Disraeli, of False Political Reports a false report if believed during three days may be of great service to a government this political maxim has been ascribed to catherine de medici an adept in coup d'etat the arcana imperii between solid lying and disguised truth there is a difference known to writers skilled in the art of governing mankind by deceiving them as politics ill understood have been defined and as indeed all party politics are these forgers prefer to use the truth disguised to the gross fiction when the real truth can no longer be concealed then they can confidently refer to it for they can still explain and obscure while they secure on their side the party whose cause they have advocated a curious reader of history may discover the temporary and sometimes the lasting advantages of spreading rumours designed to disguise or to counteract the real state of things such reports set a-going serve to break down the sharp and fatal point of a panic which might instantly occur in this way the public is saved from the horrors of consternation and the stupefaction of despair these rumours give a breathing time to prepare for the disaster which is doled out cautiously and as might be shown in some cases these first reports have left an event in so ambiguous a state that a doubt may still arise whether these reports were really destitute of truth such reports once printed enter into history and sadly perplex the honest historian of a battle fought in a remote situation both parties for a long time at home may dispute the victory after the event and the pen may prolong what the sword had long decided this has been no unusual circumstance of several of the most important battles on which the fate of europe has hung were we to rely on some reports of the time we might still doubt of the manner of the transaction a skirmish has been often raised into an arranged battle and a defeat concealed in an account of the killed and wounded while victory has been claimed by both parties villeroy in all his encounters with marlborough always sent home dispatches by which no one could suspect that he was discomfited pompey after his fatal battle with caesar sent letters to all the provinces and cities of the romans describing with greater courage than he had fought so that a report generally prevailed that caesar had lost the battle plutarch informs us that three hundred writers had described the battle of marathon many doubtless had copied their predecessors but it would perhaps have surprised us to have observed how materially some differed in their narratives in looking over a collection of manuscript letters of the times of james i i was struck by the contradictory reports of the result of the famous battle of lutzen so glorious and so fatal to gustavus adolphus the victory was sometimes reported to have been obtained by the swedes but a general uncertainty a sort of mystery agitated the majority of the nation who were staunch to the protestant cause this state of anxious suspense lasted a considerable time the fatal truth gradually came out in reports changing in their progress if the victory was allowed the death of the protestant hero closed all hope the historian of gustavus adolphus observes on this occasion that few couriers were better received than those who conveyed the accounts of the king's death to declared enemies or concealed ill-wishers nor did the report greatly displease the court of whitehall where the ministry as it usually happens in cases of timidity had its degree of apprehensions for fear the event should not be true and as i have learnt from good authority imposed silence on the news-writers and intimated the same to the pulpit in case any funeral encomium might proceed from that quarter 
although the motive assigned by the writer that of the secret indisposition of the cabinet of james i towards the fortunes of gustavus is to me by no means certain unquestionably the knowledge of this disastrous event was long kept back by a timid ministry and the fluctuating reports probably regulated by their designs the same circumstance occurred on another important event in modern history where we may observe the artifice of party writers in disguising or suppressing the real fact this was the famous battle of the boyne the french catholic party long reported that count lauzun had won the battle and that william the third was killed Bussy Rabutin, in some memoirs in which he appears to have registered public events without scrutinizing their truth, says, I chronicled this account according as the first reports gave out. When at length the real fact reached them, the party did not like to lose their pretended victory. Père Londel, who published a register of the times which is favorably noticed in the Nouvelle de la République des Lettres, for sixteen ninety nine has recorded the event in this deceptive manner the battle of the boyne in ireland schomberg is killed there at the head of the english this is an equivocator the writer resolved to conceal the defeat of james's party and cautiously suppresses any mention of a victory but very carefully gives a real fact by which his readers would hardly doubt of the defeat of the english we are so accustomed to this traffic of false reports that we are scarcely aware that many important events recorded in history were in their day strangely disguised by such mystifying accounts this we can only discover by reading private letters written at the moment bayle has collected several remarkable absurdities of this kind which were spread abroad to answer a temporary purpose but which had never been known to us had these contemporary letters not been published a report was prevalent in holland in fifteen eighty that the kings of france and spain and the duke of alva were dead a felicity which for a time sustained the exhausted spirits of the revolutionists at the invasion of the spanish armada burley spread reports of the thumbscrews and other instruments of torture which the spaniards had brought with them and thus inflamed the hatred of the nation the horrid story of the bloody colonel kirk is considered as one of those political forgeries to serve the purpose of blackening a zealous partisan false reports are sometimes stratagems of war when the chiefs of the league had lost the battle at ivry with an army broken and discomfited they still kept possession of paris merely by imposing on the inhabitants all sorts of false reports such as the death of the king of navarre at the fortunate moment when victory undetermined on which side to incline turned for the leaguers and they gave out false reports of a number of victories they had elsewhere obtained such tales distributed in pamphlets and ballads among a people agitated by doubts and fears are gladly believed flattering their wishes or soothing their alarms they contribute to their ease and are too agreeable to allow time for reflection the history of a report creating a panic may be traced in the irish insurrection in the curious memoirs of james the second a forged proclamation of the prince of orange was set forth by one speak and a rumour spread that the irish troops were killing and burning in all parts of the kingdom a magic-like panic instantly ran through the people so that in one quarter of the town of drogheda they imagined that the other was filled with blood and ruin during this panic pregnant women miscarried aged persons died with terror while the truth was that the irish themselves were disarmed and dispersed in utter want of a meal or a lodging in the unhappy times of our civil wars under charles i the newspapers and the private letters afford specimens of this political contrivance of false reports of every species no extravagance of invention to spread a terror against a party was too gross and the city of london was one day alarmed that the royalists were occupied by a plan of blowing up the river thames by an immense quantity of powder warehoused at the riverside and that there existed an organized though invisible brotherhood of many thousands with consecrated knives 
and those who hesitated to give credit to such rumours were branded as malignants who took not the danger of the parliament to heart forged conspiracies and reports of great but distant victories were inventions to keep up the spirit of a party but oftener prognosticated some intended change in the government when they were desirous of augmenting the army or introducing new garrisons or using an extreme measure with the city or the royalists there was always a new conspiracy set afloat or when any great affair was to be carried in parliament letters of great victories were published to dishearten the opposition and infuse additional boldness in their own party if the report lasted only a few days it obtained its purpose and verified the observation of catherine de medici those politicians who raised such false reports obtained their end like the architect who in building an arch supports it with circular props and pieces of timber or any temporary rubbish till he closes the arch and when it can support itself he throws away the props there is no class of political lying which can want for illustration if we consult the records of our civil wars there we may trace the whole art in all the nice management of its shades its qualities and its more complicated parts from invective to puff and from innuendo to prevarication we may admire the scrupulous correction of a lie which they had told by another which they are telling and triple lying to overreach their opponents royalists and parliamentarians were alike for to tell one great truth the father of lies is of no party footnote one of the most absurd reports that ever frightened private society was that which prevailed in paris at the end of the seventeenth century it was that the jesuits used a poisoned snuff which they gave to their opponents with the fashionable politeness of the day in offering a pinch and which for a time deterred the custom End of footnote as nothing is new under the sun so this art of deceiving the public was unquestionably practised among the ancients syphax sent scipio word that he could not unite with the romans but on the contrary had declared for the carthaginians the roman army were then anxiously waiting for his expected succours scipio was careful to show the utmost civility to these ambassadors and ostentatiously treated them with presents that his soldiers might believe they were only returning to hasten the army of syphax to join the romans livy censures the roman consul who after the defeat at cannae told the deputies of the allies the whole loss they had sustained this consul says livy by giving too faithful and open an account of his defeat made both himself and his army appear still more contemptible the result of the simplicity of the consul was that the allies despairing that the romans would ever recover their losses deemed it prudent to make terms with hannibal plutarch tells an amusing story in his way of the natural progress of a report which was contrary to the wishes of the government the unhappy reporter suffered punishment as long as the rumour prevailed though at last it proved true a stranger landing from sicily at a barber's shop delivered all the particulars of the defeat of the athenians of which however the people were yet uninformed the barber leaves untrimmed the reporter's beard and flies away to vent the news in the city where he told the archons what he had heard the whole city was thrown into a ferment the archons called an assembly of the people and produced the luckless barber who in confusion could not give any satisfactory account of the first reporter he was condemned as a spreader of false news and a disturber of the public quiet for the athenians could not imagine but that they were invincible the barber was dragged to the wheel and tortured till the disaster was more than confirmed bale referring to this story observes that had the barber reported a victory though it had proved to be false he would not have been punished a shrewd observation which occurred to him from his recollection of the fate of stratocles this person persuaded the athenians to perform a public sacrifice and thanksgiving for a victory obtained at sea though he well knew at the time that the athenian fleet had been totally defeated 
when the calamity could no longer be concealed the people charged him with being an impostor but stratocles saved his life and mollified their anger by the pleasant turn he gave the whole affair have i done you any injury said he is it not owing to me that you have spent three days in the pleasures of victory i think that this spreader of good but fictitious news should have occupied the wheel of the luckless barber who had spread bad but true news for the barber had no intention of deception but stratocles had and the question here to be tried was not the truth or the falsity of the reports but whether the reporters intended to deceive their fellow-citizens the chronicle and the post must be challenged on such a jury and all the race of news scribes whom patin characterizes as hominum genus audacissimum mendacimum awidissimum latin superlatives are too rich to suffer a translation but what patin says in his letter three hundred and fifty six may be applied these writers insert in their papers things they do not know and ought not to write it is the same trick that is playing which was formerly played it is the very same farce only it is exhibited by new actors the worst circumstance i think in this is that this trick will continue playing a long course of years and that the public suffer a great deal too much by it End of section seventy. Section seventy one of Curiosities of Literature, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume two by Isaac Disraeli. Of Suppressors and Dilapidators of Manuscripts manuscripts are suppressed or destroyed from motives which require to be noticed plagiarists at least have the merit of preservation they may blush at their artifices and deserve the pillory but their practices do not incur the capital crime of felony serassi the writer of the curious life of tasso was guilty of an extraordinary suppression in his zeal for the poet's memory the story remains to be told for it is but little known galileo in early life was a lecturer at the university of pisa delighting in poetical studies he was then more of a critic than a philosopher and had ariosto by heart this great man caught the literary mania which broke out about his time when the cruscans so absurdly began their controversi tesesca and raised up two poetical factions which infected the italians with a national fever tasso and ariosto were perpetually weighed and outweighed against each other galileo wrote annotations on tasso stanza after stanza and without reserve treating the majestic bard with a severity which must have thrown the tassoists into an agony our critic lent his manuscript to jacopo mazzoni who probably being a disguised tassoist by some accountable means contrived that the manuscript should be absolutely lost to the deep regret of the author and all the ariostoists the philosopher descended to his grave not without occasional groans nor without exulting reminiscences of the blows he had in his youth inflicted on the great rival of ariosto and the rumour of such a work long floated on tradition two centuries had nearly elapsed when serassi employed on his elaborate life of tasso among his uninterrupted researches in the public libraries of rome discovered a miscellaneous volume in which on a cursory examination he found deposited the lost manuscript of galileo it was a shock from which perhaps the zealous biographer of tasso never fairly recovered the awful name of galileo sanctioned the asperity of critical decision and more particularly the severe remarks on the language a subject on which the italians are so morbidly delicate and so trivially grave serassi's conduct on this occasion was at once political timorous and cunning 
gladly would he have annihilated the original but this was impossible it was some consolation that the manuscript was totally unknown for having got mixed with others it had accidentally been passed over and not entered into the catalogue his own diligent eye only had detected its existence Nessuno fin ora sa fuori di me se vi sia ne dove sia e cosi non potra darsi alio luce etc but in the true spirit of a collector avaricious of all things connected with his pursuit serassi cautiously but completely transcribed the precious manuscript with an intention according to his memorandum to unravel all its sophistry however although the abate never wanted leisure he persevered in his silence yet he often trembled lest some future explorer of manuscripts might be found as sharp-sighted as himself he was so cautious as not even to venture to note down the library where the manuscript was to be found and to this day no one appears to have fallen on the volume on the death of serassi his papers came to the hands of the duke of sari a lover of literature the transcript of the yet undiscovered original was then revealed and this secret history of the manuscript was drawn from a note on the title-page written by serassi himself to satisfy the urgent curiosity of the literati these annotations on tasso by galileo were published in seventeen ninety three here is a work which from its earliest stage much pains had been taken to suppress but serassi's collecting passion inducing him to preserve what he himself so much wished should never appear finally occasioned its publication it adds one evidence to the many which prove that such sinister practices have been frequently used by the historians of a party poetic or politic unquestionably this entire suppression of manuscripts has been too frequently practised it is suspected that our historical antiquary speed owed many obligations to the learned hugh broughton for he possessed a vast number of his manuscripts which he burnt why did he burn if persons place themselves in suspicious situations they must not complain if they be suspected we have had historians who whenever they met with information which has not suited their historical system or their inveterate prejudices have employed interpolations castrations and forgeries and in some cases have annihilated the entire document leland's invaluable manuscripts were left at his death in the confused state in which the mind of the writer had sunk overcome by his incessant labours when this royal antiquary was employed by henry the eighth to write our national antiquities his scattered manuscripts were long a common prey to many who never acknowledged their fountain-head among these suppressors and dilapidators pre-eminently stands the crafty italian polydori virgil who not only drew largely from this source but to cover the robbery did not omit to depreciate the father of our antiquities an act of a piece with the character of the man who is said to have collected and burnt a greater number of historical manuscripts than would have loaded a wagon to prevent the detection of the numerous fabrications in his history of england which was composed to gratify mary and the catholic cause the harleian manuscript seventy three seventy nine is a collection of state letters this manuscript has four leaves entirely torn out and is accompanied by this extraordinary memorandum signed by the principal librarian upon examination of this book november twelfth seventeen sixty four these four last leaves were torn out c morton mem memorandum november twelfth sent down to mrs macaulay as no memorandum of the name of any student to whom a manuscript is delivered for his researches was ever made before or since or in the nature of things will ever be this memorandum must involve our female historian in the obloquy of this dilapidation 
footnote it is now about thirty-seven years ago since i first published this anecdote at the same time i received information that our female historian and dilapidator had acted in this manner more than once at that distance of time this rumour so notorious at the british museum it was impossible to authenticate the rev william graham the surviving husband of mrs macaulay intemperately called on dr morton in a very advanced period of life to declare that it appeared to him that the note does not contain any evidence that the leaves were torn out by mrs macaulay it was more apparent to the unprejudiced that the doctor must have singularly lost the use of his memory when he could not explain his own official note which perhaps at the time he was compelled to insert dr morton was not unfriendly to mrs macaulay's political party he was the editor of whitelock's diary of his embassy to the queen of sweden and has i believe largely castrated the work the original lies at the british museum in the footnote such dishonest practices of party feeling indeed are not peculiar to any party in roscoe's illustrations of his life of lorenzo de medici we discover that fabroni whose character scarcely admits of suspicion appears to have known of the existence of an unpublished letter of sixtus the fourth which involves that pontiff deeply in the assassination projected by the pazzi but he carefully suppressed its notice yet in his conscience he could not avoid alluding to such documents which he concealed by his silence roscoe has apologized for fabroni overlooking this decisive evidence of the guilt of the hypocritical pontiff in the mass of manuscripts a circumstance not likely to have occurred however to this laborious historical inquirer all party feeling is the same active spirit with an opposite direction we have a remarkable case where a most interesting historical production has been silently annihilated by the consent of both parties there once existed an important diary of a very extraordinary character sir george saville afterwards marquis of halifax this master spirit for such i am inclined to consider the author of the little book of maxims and reflections with a philosophical indifference appears to have held in equal contempt all the factions of his times and consequently has often incurred their severe censures among other things the marquis of halifax had noted down the conversation he had had with charles the second and the great and busy characters of the age of this curious secret history there existed two copies and the noble writer imagined that by this means he had carefully secured their existence yet both copies were destroyed from opposite motives the one at the instigation of pope who was alarmed at finding some of the catholic intrigues of the court developed and the other at the suggestion of a noble friend who was equally shocked at discovering that his party the revolutionists had sometimes practised mean and dishonourable deceptions it is in these legacies of honourable men of whatever party they may be that we expect to find truth and sincerity but thus it happens that the last hope of posterity is frustrated by the artifices or the malignity of these party passions Pulteney, afterwards the earl of bath had also prepared memoirs of his times which he proposed to confide to dr douglas bishop of salisbury to be composed by the bishop but his lordship's heir the general insisted on destroying these authentic documents of the value of which we have a notion by one of those conversations which the earl was in the habit of indulging with hook whom he at that time appears to have intended for his historian the earl of anglesey's manuscript history of the troubles of ireland and also a diary of his own times have been suppressed a busy observer of his contemporaries his tale would materially have assisted a later historian 
the same hostility to manuscripts as may be easily imagined has occurred perhaps more frequently on the continent i shall furnish one considerable fact a french canon claude joly a bold and learned writer had finished an ample life of erasmus which included a history of the restoration of literature at the close of the fifteenth and the beginning of the sixteenth century colomier tells us that the author had read over the works of erasmus seven times we have positive evidence that the manuscript was finished for the press the cardinal du noailles would examine the work himself this important history was not only suppressed but the hope entertained of finding it among the cardinal's papers was never realized these are instances of the annihilation of history but there is a partial suppression or castration of passages equally fatal to the cause of truth a practice too prevalent among the first editors of memoirs by such deprivations of the text we have lost important truths while in some cases by interpolations we have been loaded with the fictions of a party original memoirs when published should now be deposited at that great institution consecrated to our national history the british museum to be verified at all times in lord herbert's history of henry the eighth i find by a manuscript note that several things were not permitted to be printed and that the original manuscript was supposed to be in mr sheldon's custody in sixteen eighty seven camden told sir robert Fillmore that he was not suffered to print all his annals of elizabeth but he providently sent these expurgated passages to de tu who printed them faithfully and it is remarkable that de tu himself used the same precaution in the continuation of his own history we like remote truths but truths too near us never fail to alarm ourselves our connections and our party milton in composing his history of england introduced in the third book a very remarkable digression on the characters of the long parliament a most animated description of a class of political adventurers with whom modern history has presented many parallels from tenderness to a party then imagined to be subdued it was struck out by command nor do i find it restituted by kennett's collection of english histories this admirable and exquisite delineation has been preserved in a pamphlet printed in sixteen eighty one which has fortunately exhibited one of the warmest pictures in design and colouring by a master's hand one of our most important volumes of secret history whitelock's memorials was published by arthur earl of anglesey in sixteen eighty two who took considerable liberties with the manuscript another edition appeared in seventeen thirty two which restored the many important passages through which the earl appears to have struck his castrating pen the restitution of the castrated passages has not much increased the magnitude of this folio volume for the omissions usually consisted of a characteristic stroke or short critical opinion which did not harmonize with the private feelings of the earl of anglesey in consequence of the volume not being much enlarged to the eye and being unaccompanied by a single line of preface to inform us of the value of this more complete edition the booksellers imagine that there can be no material difference between the two editions and wonder at the bibliopolical mystery that they can afford to sell the edition of sixteen eighty two at ten shillings and have five guineas for the edition of seventeen thirty two hume who i have been told wrote his history usually on a sofa with the epicurean indolence of his fine genius always refers to the old truncated and faithless edition of whitelock so little in his day did the critical history of books enter into the studies of authors or such was the carelessness of our historian there is more philosophy in editions than some philosophers are aware of perhaps most memoirs have been unfaithfully published curtailed of their fair proportions and not a few might be noticed which subsequent editors 
have restored to their original state by uniting their dislocated limbs unquestionably passion has sometimes annihilated manuscripts and tamely revenged itself on the papers of hated writers louis the fourteenth with his own hands after the death of fenelon burnt all the manuscripts which the duke of burgundy had preserved of his preceptor as an example of the suppressors and dilapidators of manuscripts i shall give an extraordinary fact concerning louis the fourteenth more in his favour his character appears like some other historical personages equally disguised by adulation and calumny that monarch was not the nero which his revocation of the edict of nantes made him seem to the french protestants he was far from approving of the violent measures of his catholic clergy this opinion of that sovereign was however carefully suppressed when his instructions to the dauphin were first published it is now ascertained that louis the fourteenth was for many years equally zealous and industrious and among other useful attempts composed an elaborate discours for the dauphin for his future conduct the king gave his manuscript to pelisson to revise but after the revision our royal writer frequently inserted additional paragraphs the work first appeared in an anonymous recuil d'aspuscule littéraire amsterdam seventeen sixty seven which barbier in his anonyme tells us was rédigé par pelisson le tout publié par l'abbé olivé when at length the printed work was collated with the manuscript original several suppressions of the royal sentiments appeared and the editors too catholic had with more particular caution thrown aside what clearly showed louis the fourteenth was far from approving of the violences used against the protestants the following passage was entirely omitted it seems to me my son that those who employ extreme and violent remedies do not know the nature of the evil occasioned in part by heated minds which left to themselves would insensibly be extinguished rather than rekindle them afresh by the force of contradiction above all when the corruption is not confined to a small number but diffused through all parts of the state besides the reformers said many true things the best method to have reduced little by little the huguenots of my kingdom was not to have pursued them by any direct severity pointed at them lady mary wortley montague is a remarkable instance of an author nearly lost to the nation she is only known to posterity by a chance publication for such were her famous turkish letters the manuscript of which her family once purchased with an intention to suppress but they were frustrated by a transcript the more recent letters were reluctantly extracted out of the family trunks and surrendered in exchange for certain family documents which had fallen into the hands of a bookseller had it depended on her relatives the name of lady mary had only reached us in the satires of pope the greater part of her epistolary correspondence was destroyed by her mother and what that good and gothic lady spared was suppressed by the hereditary austerity of rank of which her family was too susceptible the entire correspondence of this admirable writer and studious woman for once in perusing some unpublished letters of lady mary's i discovered that she had been in the habit of reading seven hours a day for many years would undoubtedly have exhibited a fine statue instead of the torso we now possess and we might have lived with her ladyship as we do with madame de sévigné this i have mentioned elsewhere but i have since discovered that a considerable correspondence of lady mary's for more than twenty years with the widow of colonel forrester who had retired to rome has been stifled in the birth these letters with other manuscripts of lady mary's were given by mrs forrester to philip thickness with a discretionary power to publish they were held as a great acquisition by thickness and his bookseller but when they had printed off 
the first thousand sheets there were parts which they considered might give pain to some of the family thickness says lady mary had in many places been uncommonly severe upon her husband for all her letters were loaded with a scrap or two of poetry at him footnote there was one passage he recollected just left my bed a lifeless trunk and scarce a dreaming head End of footnote. a negotiation took place with an agent of lord butte's after some time miss forrester put in her claims for the manuscripts and the whole terminated as thickness tells us in her obtaining a pension and lord butte all the manuscripts the late duke of bridgewater i am informed burnt many of the numerous family papers and bricked up a quantity which when opened after his death were found to have perished it is said he declared that he did not choose that his ancestors should be traced back to a person of a mean trade which it seems might possibly have been the case the loss now cannot be appreciated but unquestionably stores of history and perhaps of literature were sacrificed milton's manuscript of comus was published from the bridgewater collection for it had escaped the bricking up manuscripts of great interest are frequently suppressed from the shameful indifference of the possessors mr matthias in his essay on gray tells us that in addition to the valuable manuscripts of mr gray there is reason to think that there were some other papers folio sibylli in the possession of mr mason but though a very diligent and anxious inquiry has been made after them they cannot be discovered since his death there was however one fragment by mr mason's own description of it of very great value namely the plan of an intended speech in latin on his appointment as professor of modern history in the university of cambridge mr mason says immediately on his appointment mr gray sketched out an admirable plan for his inauguration speech in which after enumerating the preparatory and auxiliary studies requisite such as ancient history geography chronology etc he descended to the authentic sources of the science such as public treaties state records private correspondence of ambassadors etc he also wrote the exordium of this thesis not indeed so correct as to be given by way of fragment but so spirited in point of sentiment as leaves it much to be regretted that he did not proceed to its conclusion this fragment cannot now be found and after so very interesting a description of its value and of its importance it is difficult to conceive how mr mason could prevail upon himself to withhold it if there be a subject on which more perhaps than on any other it would have been peculiarly desirable to know and to follow the train of the ideas of gray it is that of modern history in which no man was more intimately more accurately or more extensively conversant than our poet a sketch or plan from his hand on the subjects of history and on those which belonged to it might have taught succeeding ages how to conduct these important researches with national advantage and like some wand of divination it might have pointed to beds where sovereign gold doth grow dryden footnote i have seen a transcript by the favour of a gentleman who sent it to me of gray's directions for heading history it had its merit at a time when our best histories had not been published but it is entirely superseded by the admirable méthode of l'anglais du fresnoy end of footnote i suspect that i could point out the place in which these precious folia sibylli of gray's lie interred they would no doubt be found among other sibylline leaves of mason in two large boxes which he left to the care of his executors these gentlemen as i am informed are so extremely careful of them as to have intrepidly resisted the importunity of some lovers of literature whose curiosity has been aroused by the secreted treasures it is a misfortune which has frequently attended this sort of bequests of literary men that they have left their manuscripts like their household furniture and in several cases we find that many legatees conceive that all manuscripts are either to be burnt like obsolete receipts or to be nailed down in a box that they may not stir a lawsuit 
in a manuscript note of the times i find that sir richard baker the author of a chronicle formerly the most popular one died in the fleet and that his son-in-law who had all his papers burnt them for waste paper and he said that he thought sir richard's life was among them an autobiography of those days which we should now highly prize among these mutilators of manuscripts we cannot too strongly remonstrate with those who have the care of the works of others and convert them into a vehicle for their own particular purposes even when they run directly counter to the knowledge and opinions of the original writer hard was the fate of honest anthony wood when dr fell undertook to have his history of oxford translated into latin the translator a sullen dogged fellow when he observed that wood was enraged at seeing the perpetual alterations of his copy made to please dr fell delighted to alter it the more while the greater execution supervising the printed sheets by correcting altering or dashing out what he pleased compelled the writer publicly to disavow his own work such i have heard was the case of brian edwards who composed the first accounts of mungo park brian edwards whose personal interests were opposed to the abolishment of the slave trade would not suffer any passage to stand in which the african traveller had expressed his conviction of its inhumanity park among confidential friends frequently complained that his work did not only not contain his opinions but was even interpolated with many which he utterly disclaimed suppressed books become as rare as manuscripts in some researches relating to the history of the mar prelate faction that ardent conspiracy against the established hierarchy and of which the very name is but imperfectly to be traced in our history i discovered that the books and manuscripts of the mar prelates have been too cautiously suppressed or too completely destroyed while those on the other side have been as carefully preserved in our national collection the british museum we find a great deal against mar prelate but not mar prelate himself i have written the history of this conspiracy in the third volume of quarrels of authors end of section seventy one Section 72 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2 by Isaac Disraeli. Parodies. A lady of Bob Bleu celebrity the term is getting odious particularly to our scavant had two friends whom she equally admired an elegant poet and his parodist she had contrived to prevent their meeting as long as her stratagems lasted till at length she apologized to the serious bard for inviting him when his mock umbra was to be present astonished she perceived that both men of genius felt a mutual esteem for each other's opposite talent the ridiculed had perceived no malignity in the playfulness of the parody and even seemed to consider it as a compliment aware that parodists do not waste their talent on obscure productions while the ridiculer himself was very sensible that he was the inferior poet the lady critic had imagined that parody must necessarily be malicious and in some cases it is said those on whom the parody has been performed have been of the same opinion parody strongly resembles mimicry a principle in human nature not so artificial as it appears man may be well defined a mimetic animal the african boy who amused the whole caffel he journeyed with by mimicking the gestures and the voice of the auctioneer who had sold him at the slave market a few days before could have had no sense of scorn of superiority or of malignity the boy experienced merely the pleasure of repeating attitudes and intonations which had so forcibly excited his interest the numerous 
parodies of hamlet soliloquy were never made in derision of that solemn monologue any more than the travesties of virgil by scarron and cotton their authors were never so gaily mad as that we have parodies on the psalms by luther dodsley parodied the book of chronicles and the scripture's style was parodied by franklin in his beautiful story of abraham a story he found in jeremy taylor and which taylor borrowed from the east for it is preserved in the persian sadi not one of these writers however proposed to ridicule their originals some ingenuity in the application was all they intended the lady critic alluded to had suffered by a panic in imagining that a parody was necessarily a corrosive satire had she indeed proceeded one step farther and asserted that parodies might be classed among the most malicious inventions in literature when they are such as coleman and lloyd made on gray in their odes to oblivion and obscurity her reading possibly might have supplied the materials of the present research parodies were frequently practised by the ancients and with them like ourselves consisted of a work grafted on another work but which turned on a different subject by a slight change of the expressions it might be a sport of fancy the innocent child of mirth or a satirical arrow drawn from the quiver of caustic criticism or it was that malignant art which only studies to make the original of the parody however beautiful contemptible and ridiculous human nature thus enters into the composition of parodies and their variable character originates in the purpose of their application there is in the million a natural taste for farce after tragedy and they gladly relieve themselves by mitigating the solemn seriousness of the tragic drama for they find that it is but a step from the sublime to the ridiculous the taste for parody will i fear always prevail for whatever tends to ridicule a work of genius is usually very agreeable to a great number of contemporaries in the history of parodies some of the learned have noticed a superstitious circumstance which however may have happened for it is a very natural one when the rhapsodists who strolled from town to town to chant different fragments of the poems of homer had recited they were immediately followed by another set of strollers buffoons who made the same audience merry by the burlesque turn which they gave to the solemn strains which had just so deeply engaged their attention it is supposed that we have one of these travestiers of the iliad in one sotates who succeeded by only changing the measure of the verses without altering the words which entirely disguised the homeric character fragments of which scattered in dionysius halicarnassensis i leave to the curiosity of the learned grecian footnote henry stephen appears first to have started this subject of parody his researches have been borrowed by the abbe salier to whom in my turn i am occasionally indebted his little dissertation is in the french academy's memoirs tome seven three hundred ninety eight end of footnote homer's battle of the frogs and mice a learned critic the elder heinsius asserts was not written by the poet but is a parody on the poem it is evidently as good-humoured and one as any in the rejected addresses and it was because homer was the most popular poet that he was most susceptible of the playful honours of the parodist unless the prototype is familiar to us a parody is nothing of these parodists of homer we may regret the loss of one time and aphilius whose parodies were termed silly from silenus being their chief personage he levelled them at the sophistical philosophers of his age his invocation is grafted on the opening of the iliad to recount the evil doings of those babblers whom he compares to the bags in which aeolus deposited all his winds 
balloons inflated with empty ideas we should like to have appropriated some of these silly or parodies of time in the syllograph which however seem to have been at times calumnious footnote see a specimen in aulus gellius where this parodist reproaches plato for having given a high price for a book whence he drew his noble dialogue of the timaeus book three canto seventeen end of footnote shenstone's school mistress and some few other ludicrous poems derive much of their merit from parody this taste for parodies was very prevalent with the grecians and is a species of humour which perhaps has been too rarely practised by the moderns cervantes has some passages of this nature in his parodies of the old chivalric romances fielding in some parts of his tom jones and joseph andrews in his burlesque poetical descriptions and swift in his battle of books and tale of a tub but few writers have equalled the delicacy and felicity of pope's parodies in the rape of the lock such parodies give refinement to burlesque the ancients made a liberal use of it in their satirical comedy and sometimes carried it on through an entire work as in the menippean satire seneca's mock eloge of claudius and lucian in his dialogues there are parodies even in plato and an anecdotical one recorded of this philosopher shows them in their most simple state dissatisfied with his own poetical essays he threw them into the flames that is the sage resolved to sacrifice his verses to the god of fire and in repeating that line in homer where thetis addresses vulcan to implore his aid the application became a parody although it required no other change than the insertion of the philosopher's name instead of the goddesses vulcan arise tis plato claims thy aid footnote see spanheim les Césars de l'empereur julien in his preuve remark eight salier judiciously observes il peut nous donner une juste idée de cette sorte d'ouvrage mais nous ne savons pas précisément en quel thème il a été composé no more truly than the iliad itself End of footnote. boileau affords a happy instance of this simple parody cornille in his cid makes one of his personages remark pour grand que soit les oies ils sont ce que nous sommes ils peuvent se tromper comme les autres hommes a slight alteration became a fine parody in boyau's chapelain des coiffes pour grand que soit les oies ils sont ce que nous sommes ou fait trompant envers comme les autres hommes we find in athenaeus the name of the inventor of a species of parody which more immediately engages our notice dramatic parodies it appears this inventor was a satirist so that the lady critic whose opinion we had the honour of noticing would be warranted by appealing to its origin to determine the nature of the thing a dramatic parody which produced the greatest effect was the gigantomachia as appears by the only circumstance known of it never laughed the athenians so heartily as at its representation for the fatal news of the deplorable state to which the affairs of the republic were reduced in sicily arrived at its first representation and the athenians continued laughing to the end as the modern athenians the volatile parisians might in their national concern of an opera comique it was the business of the dramatic parody to turn the solemn tragedy which the audience had just seen exhibited into a farcical comedy the same actors who had appeared in magnificent dresses now returned on the stage in grotesque habiliments with odd postures and gestures while the story though the same was incongruous and ludicrous the cyclops of euripides is probably the only remaining specimen 
for this may be considered as a parody on the ninth book of the odyssey the adventures of ulysses in the cave of polyphemus where silenus and a chorus of satyrs are farcically introduced to contrast with the grave narrative of homer of the shifts and escape of the cunning man from the one-eyed ogre the jokes are too coarse for the french taste of brumois who in his translation goes on with a critical growl and foolish apology for euripides having written a farce brumois like pistol is forced to eat his onion but with a worse grace swallowing and execrating to the end in dramatic composition aristophanes is perpetually hooking in parodies of euripides whom of all poets he hated as well as of aeschylus sophocles and other tragic bards since at length that grecian wit has found a translator saturated with his genius and an interpreter as philosophical the subject of grecian parody will probably be reflected in a clearer light from his researches dramatic parodies in modern literature were introduced by our vivacious neighbours and may be said to constitute a class of literary satires peculiar to the french nation what had occurred in greece a similar gaiety of national genius unconsciously reproduced the dramatic parodies in our own literature as in the rehearsal tom thumb footnote the first edition of this play is a solemn parody throughout in the preface the author defends it from being as maliciously reported a burlesque on the loftiest parts of tragedy and designed to banish what we generally call fine writing from the stage when he afterwards quotes parallel passages from popular plays which he has parodied he does so saying whether this sameness of thought and expression which i have quoted from them proceeded from an agreement in their way of thinking or whether they have borrowed from our author i leave the reader to determine End of footnote. and the critic however exquisite are confined to particular passages and are not grafted on a whole original we have neither naturalized the dramatic parody into a species nor dedicated to it the honours of a separate theatre this peculiar dramatic satire a burlesque of an entire tragedy the volatile genius of the parisians accomplished whenever a new tragedy which still continues the favoured species of drama with the french attracted the notice of the town shortly after uprose its parody at the italian theatre so that both pieces may have been performed in immediate succession in the same evening a french tragedy is most susceptible of this sort of ridicule by applying its declamatory style its exaggerated sentiments and its romantic out-of-the-way nature to the commonplace incidents and persons of domestic life out of the stuff of which they made their emperors their heroes and their princesses they cut out a pompous country justice a hectoring tailor or an impudent mantua maker but it was not merely this travesty of great personages nor the lofty effusions of one in a lowly station which terminated the object of parody it was designed for a higher object that of more obviously exposing the original for any absurdity in its scenes or in its catastrophe and dissecting its faulty characters in a word weighing in the critical scales the nonsense of the poet parody sometimes became a refined instructor for the public whose discernment is often blinded by party or prejudice but it was too a severe touchstone for genius racine some say smiled others say he did not when he witnessed harlequin in the language of titus to berenice declaiming on some ludicrous affair to columbine la motte was very sore and voltaire and others shrunk away with a cry from a parody voltaire was angry when he witnessed his mariamne parodied by le mauvais menage or bad housekeeping the aged jealous herod was turned into an old cross-country justice varou bewitched by mariamne strutted a dragoon 
and the whole establishment showed it was under very bad management fuselier collected some of these parodies and not unskilfully defends their nature and their object against the protest of la motte whose tragedies had severely suffered from these burlesques his celebrated domestic tragedy of inez de castro the fable of which turns on a concealed and clandestine marriage produced one of the happiest parodies in agnes de chaillot in the parody the cause of the mysterious obstinacy of pierrot the son in persisting to refuse the hand of the daughter of his mother-in-law madame la baillive is thus discovered by her to monsieur le baillif mon mari pour le coup j'ai découvert l'affaire ne vous étonnez plus qu'à nos désirs contraires pour ma fille pierrot ne montre que mépris voilà l'unique objet dont son cœur est épris pointing to agnes de chaillot the bailiff exclaims ma servant this single word was the most lively and fatal criticism of the tragic action of inez de castro which according to the conventional decorum and fastidious code of french criticism grossly violated the majesty of melpomene by giving a motive and an object so totally undignified to the tragic tale in the parody there was something ludicrous when the secret came out which explained poor pierrot's long-concealed perplexities in the maid-servant bringing forward a whole legitimate family of her own lamotte was also galled by a projected parody of his machabees where the hasty marriage of the young machabeus and the sudden conversion of the amorous antigone who for her first penitential act persuades a youth to marry her without first deigning to consult her respectable mother would have produced an excellent scene for the parody but la motte prefixed an angry preface to his inez de castro he inveighs against all parodies which he asserts to be merely a french fashion we have seen however that it was once grecian the offspring of a dangerous spirit of ridicule and the malicious amusement of superficial minds were this true retorts fuselier we ought to detest parodies but we maintain that far from converting virtue into a paradox and degrading truth by ridicule parody will only strike at what is chimerical and false it is not a piece of buffoonery so much as a critical exposition what do we parody but the absurdities of dramatic writers who frequently make their heroes act against nature common sense and truth after all he ingeniously adds it is the public not we who are the authors of these parodies for they are usually but the echoes of the pit and we parodists have only to give a dramatic form to the opinions and observations we hear many tragedies fuselier with admirable truth observes disguise vices into virtues and parodies unmask them we have had tragedies recently which very much required parodies to expose them and to shame our inconsiderate audiences who patronize these monsters of false passions the rants and bombast of some of these might have produced with little or no alteration of the inflated originals a modern rehearsal or a new tragedy for warm weather footnote the tailors a tragedy for warm weather was originally brought out by foot in seventeen sixty seven there had been great disturbances between the master tailors and journeymen about wages at this time and the author has amusingly worked out the disputes and their consequences in the heroic style of a blank verse tragedy End of, footnote. of parodies we may safely approve the legitimate use and even indulge their agreeable maliciousness while we must still dread that extraordinary facility to which the public or rather human nature is so prone as sometimes to laugh at what at another time they would shed tears tragedy is rendered comic or burlesque by altering the station and manners of the persons and the reverse may occur 
of raising what is comic or burlesque into tragedy on so little depends the sublime or the ridiculous beattie says in most human characters there are blemishes moral intellectual or corporeal by exaggerating which to a certain degree you may form a comic character as by raising the virtues abilities or external advantages of individuals you form epic or tragic characters a subject humorously touched on by lloyd in the prologue to the jealous wife quarrels upbraidings jealousies and spleen grow too familiar in the comic scene tinge but the language with heroic chime tis passion pathos character sublime what big round words had swelled the pompous scene a king the husband and the wife a queen end of section seventy two section seventy three of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli anecdotes of the fairfax family will a mind of great capacity be reduced to mediocrity by the ill choice of a profession parents are interested in the metaphysical discussion whether there really exists an inherent quality in the human intellect which imparts to the individual an aptitude for one pursuit more than for another what lord shaftesbury calls not innate but co-natural qualities of the human character were during the latter part of the last century entirely rejected but of late there appears a tendency to return to the notion which is consecrated by antiquity experience will often correct modern hypothesis the term predisposition may be objectionable as are all terms which pretend to describe the occult operations of nature and at present we have no other our children pass through the same public education while they are receiving little or none for their individual dispositions should they have sufficient strength of character to indicate any the great secret of education is to develop the faculties of the individual for it may happen that his real talent may lie hidden and buried under his education a profession is usually adventitious made by chance views or by family arrangements should a choice be submitted to the youth himself he will often mistake slight and transient tastes for permanent dispositions a decided character however we may often observe is repugnant to a particular pursuit delighting in another talents languid and vacillating in one profession we might find vigorous and settled in another an indifferent lawyer might become an admirable architect at present all our human bullion is sent to be melted down in an university to come out as if thrown into a burning mould a bright physician a bright lawyer a bright divine in other words to adapt themselves for a profession preconcerted by their parents by this means we may secure a titular profession for our son but the true genius of the avocation in the bent of the mind as a man of great original powers called it is too often absent instead of finding fit offices for fit men we are perpetually discovering on the stage of society actors out of character our most popular writer has happily described this error a laughing philosopher the democritus of our day once compared human life to a table pierced with a number of holes each of which has a pin made exactly to fit it but which pins being stuck in hastily and without selection chance leads inevitably to the most awkward mistakes for how often do we see the orator pathetically concluded how often i say do we see the round man stuck into the three-cornered hole in looking over a manuscript life of toby matthews archbishop of york 
in james the first reign i found a curious anecdote of his grace's disappointment in the dispositions of his sons the cause indeed is not uncommon as was confirmed by another great man to whom the archbishop confessed it the old lord thomas fairfax one day finding the archbishop very melancholy inquired the reason of his grace's pensiveness my lord said the archbishop i have great reason of sorrow with respect of my sons one of whom has wit and no grace another grace but no wit and the third neither grace nor wit your case replied lord fairfax is not singular i am also sadly disappointed in my sons one i sent into the netherlands to train him up a soldier and he makes a tolerable country justice but a mere coward at fighting my next i sent to cambridge and he proves a good lawyer but a mere dunce at divinity and my youngest i sent to the inns of court and he is good at divinity but nobody at the law the relator of this anecdote adds this i have often heard from the descendant of that honourable family who yet seems to mince the matter because so immediately related the eldest son was the lord ferdinando fairfax and the gunsmith to thomas lord fairfax the son of this lord ferdinando heard the old lord thomas call aloud to his grandson tom tom mind thou the battle thy father's a good man but a mere coward all the good i expect is from thee it is evident that the old lord thomas fairfax was a military character and in his earnest desire of continuing a line of heroes had preconcerted to make his eldest son a military man who we discover turned out to be admirably fitted for a worshipful justice of the quorum this is a lesson for the parent who consults his own inclinations and not those of natural disposition in the present case the same lord though disappointed appears still to have persisted in the same wish of having a great military character in his family having missed one in his elder son and settled his other sons in different avocations the grandfather persevered and fixed his hopes and bestowed his encouragements on his grandson sir thomas fairfax who makes so distinguished a figure in the civil wars the difficulty of discerning the aptitude of a youth for any particular destination in life will perhaps even for the most skilful parent be always hazardous many will be inclined in despair of anything better to throw dice with fortune or adopt the determination of the father who settled his sons by a whimsical analogy which he appears to have formed of their dispositions or aptness for different pursuits the boys were standing under a hedge in the rain and a neighbour reported to the father the conversation he had overheard john wished it would rain books for he wished to be a preacher bezaleel wool to be a clothier like his father samuel money to be a merchant and edmund plums to be a grocer the father took these wishes as a hint and we are told in the life of john angier the elder son a puritan minister that he chose for them these different callings in which it appears that they settled successfully whatever a young man at first applies himself to is commonly his delight afterwards this is an important principle discovered by hartley but it will not supply the parent with any determinate regulation how to distinguish a transient from a permanent disposition or how to get at what we may call the connatural qualities of the mind a particular opportunity afforded me some close observation on the characters and habits of two youths brothers in blood and affection and partners in all things who even to their very dress shared alike who were never separated from each other who were taught by the same masters lived under the same roof and were accustomed to the same uninterrupted habits yet had nature created them totally distinct in the qualities of their minds and similar as their lives had been their abilities were adapted for very opposite pursuits either of them could not have been the other and i observed how the predisposition of the parties was distinctly marked from childhood the one slow penetrating and correct the other quick irritable and fanciful the one persevering in examination the other rapid in results the one exhausted by labour the other impatient of whatever did not relate to his own pursuit 
the one logical historical and critical the other having acquired nothing decided on all things by his own sensations we would confidently consult in the one a great legal character and the other an artist of genius if nature had not secretly placed a bias in their distinct minds how could two similar beings have been so dissimilar a story recorded of cecco d'ascoli and of dante on the subject of natural and acquired genius may illustrate the present topic cecco maintained that nature was more potent than art while dante asserted the contrary to prove his principle the great italian bard referred to his cat which by repeated practice he had taught to hold a candle in its paw while he supped or read cecco desired to witness the experiment and came not unprepared for his purpose when dante's cat was performing its part cecco lifting up the lid of a pot which he had filled with mice the creature of art instantly showed the weakness of a talent merely acquired and dropping the candle flew on the mice with all its instinctive propensity dante was himself disconcerted and it was adjudged that the advocate for the occult principle of native faculties had gained his cause to tell stories however is not to lay down principles yet principles may sometimes be concealed in stories footnote i have arranged many facts connected with the present subject in the fifth chapter of the literary character in the enlarged and fourth edition eighteen twenty eight end of footnote end of section seventy three section seventy four of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by greg giordano curiosities of literature volume two by isaac desraeli medicine and morals a stroke of personal ridicule is levelled at dryden when bayes informs us of his preparations for a course of study by a course of medicine Quote, when i have found a grand design says he i ever take psychic and let blood for when you would have pure swiftness of thought and fiery flights of fancy you must have a care of the pensive part in fine you must purge the belly End quote. such was really the practice of the poet as le Mott, who was a physician informs us and in his medical character did not perceive that ridicule in the subject which the wits and most readers unquestionably have enjoyed the wits here were as cruel against truth as against dryden for we must still consider this practice to use their own words as an excellent recipe for writing among other philosophers one of the most famous disputants of antiquity camedes was accustomed to take copious doses of white hellebore a great aperient as a preparation to refute the dogmas of the stoics Quote, the thing that gives me the highest spirits it seems absurd but true is a dose of salts but one can't take them like champagne End quote, said lord byron dryden's practice was neither whimsical nor peculiar to the poet he was of a full habit and no doubt had often found by experience the beneficial effects without being aware of the cause which is nothing less than the reciprocal influence of mind and body this simple fact is indeed connected with one of the most important inquiries in the history of man the laws which regulate the invisible union of the soul with the body in a word the inscrutable mystery of our being a secret but an undoubted intercourse which probably must ever elude our perceptions the combination of metaphysics 
with physics has only been productive of the wildest fairy tales among philosophers with one party the soul seems to pass away in its last puff of air while man seems to perish in quote, dust to dust end quote. the other as successfully gets rid of our bodies altogether by denying the existence of matter we are not certain that mind and matter are distinct existences since the one may be only a modification of the other however this great mystery be imagined you shall find with dr gregory in his lectures quote, on the duties and qualifications of a physician end quote, that it forms an equally necessary inquiry in the sciences of morals and medicine whether we consider the vulgar distinction of mind and body as an union or as a modified existence no philosopher denies that a reciprocal action takes place between our moral and physical condition of these sympathies like many other mysteries of nature the cause remains occult while the effects are obvious this close yet inscrutable association this concealed correspondence of parts seemingly unconnected in a word this reciprocal influence of the mind and the body has long fixed the attention of medical and metaphysical inquirers the one having the care of our exterior organization the other that of the interior can we conceive the mysterious inhabitant as forming a part of its own inhabitation the tenant and the house are so inseparable that in striking at any part of the dwelling you inevitably reach the dweller if the mind be disordered we may often look for its seat in some corporeal derangement often are our thoughts disturbed by a strange irritability which we do not even pretend to account for the state of the body called the fidgets is a disorder to which the ladies are particularly liable a physician of my acquaintance was earnestly entreated by a female patient to give a name to her unknown complaints this he found no difficulty to do as he is a sturdy searcher of the materiality of our nature he declared that her disorder was atmospherical it was the disorder of her frame under damp weather which was reacting on her mind and physical means by operating on her body might be applied to restore her to her half-lost senses our imagination is higher when our stomach is not overloaded in spring than in winter in solitude than amidst company and in an obscured light than in the blaze and heat of the noon in all these cases the body is evidently acted on and reacts on the mind sometimes our dreams present us with images of our restlessness till we recollect that the seat of our brain may perhaps lie in our stomach rather than on the pineal gland of descartes and that the most artificial logic to make us somewhat reasonable may be swallowed with the blue pill our domestic happiness often depends on the state of our biliary and digestive organs and the little disturbances of conjugal life may be more efficaciously cured by the physician than by the moralist for a sermon misapplied will never act so directly as a sharp medicine the learned gabius an eminent professor of medicine at leyden who called himself quote, professor of the passions End quote. gives the case of a lady of too inflammable a constitution whom her husband unknown to herself had gradually reduced to a model of decorum by phlebotomy her complexion indeed lost the roses which some perhaps had too wantonly admired for the repose of her conjugal physician the art of curing moral disorders by corporeal means has not yet been brought into general practice although it is probable that some quiet sages of medicine have made use of it on some occasions the leyden professor we have just alluded to delivered at the university a discourse quote, on the management and care of the disorders of the mind by application to the body end quote. descartes conjectured that as the mind seems so dependent on the disposition of the bodily organs if any means can be found to render men wiser and more ingenious than they have been hitherto such a method might be sought from the assistance of medicine 
the sciences of morals and of medicine will therefore be found to have a more intimate connection than has been suspected plato thought that a man must have natural dispositions towards virtue to become virtuous that it cannot be educated you cannot make a bad man a good man which he ascribes to the evil dispositions of the body as well as to a bad education there are unquestionably constitutional moral disorders some good-tempered but passionate persons have acknowledged that they cannot avoid those temporary fits to which they are liable and which they say they always suffered quote, from a child end quote if they arise from too great a fullness of blood is it not cruel to abrade rather than to cure them which might easily be done by taking away their redundant humours and thus quieting the most passionate man alive a moral patient who allows his brain to be disordered by the fumes of liquor instead of being suffered to be a ridiculous being might have opiates prescribed for in laying him asleep as soon as possible ye remove the cause of his sudden madness there are crimes for which men are hanged, but of which they might easily have been cured by physical means. Persons out of their senses with love, by throwing themselves into a river, and being dragged out nearly lifeless, have recovered their senses and lost their bewildering passion. Submersion is discovered to be a cure for some mental disorders, by altering the state of the body, as van Helmont notices, quote, was happily practiced in England. End quote. With the circumstance to which the sage of chemistry alludes, I am unacquainted, but this extraordinary practice was certainly known to the Italians. For in one of the tales of the Poggio, we find a mad doctor of Milan, who was celebrated for curing lunatics and demoniacs in a certain time. His practice consisted in placing them in a great, high walled courtyard, in the midst of which there was a deep well full of water cold as ice when a demoniac was brought to this physician he had the patient bound to a pillar in the well till the water ascended to the knees or higher and even to the neck as he deemed their malady required in their bodily pain they appeared to have forgot their melancholy thus by the terrors of the repetition of cold water a man appears to have been frightened into his senses a physician has informed me of a remarkable case a lady with a disordered mind resolved on death and swallowed much more than half a pint of laudanum she closed her curtains in the evening took a farewell of her attendants and flattered herself she would never awaken from her sleep in the morning however notwithstanding this incredible dose she awoke in the agonies of death by the usual means she was enabled to get rid of the poison she had so largely taken and not only recovered her life but what is more extraordinary her perfect senses the physician conjectures that it was the influence of her disordered mind over her body which prevented this vast quantity of laudanum from its usual action by terminating in death footnote a physician of eminence has told us of the melancholy termination of the life of a gentleman who in a state of mental aberration cut his throat loss of blood restored his mind to a healthy condition but the wound unfortunately proved fatal End of footnote. moral vices or infirmities which originate in the state of the body may be cured by topical applications precepts and ethics in such cases if they seem to produce a momentary cure have only moved the weeds whose roots lie in the soil it is only by changing the soil itself that we can eradicate these evils the senses are five porches for the physician to enter into the mind to keep it in repair by altering the state of the body we are changing that of the mind and whenever the defects of the mind depend on those of the organization the mind or soul however distinct its being from the body is disturbed or excited independent of its volition by the mechanical impulses of the body a man becomes stupefied when the circulation of the blood is impeded in the viscera he acts more from instinct than reflection the nervous fibres are too relaxed or too tense and he finds a difficulty in moving them if you heighten his sensations 
you awaken new ideas in the stupid being. And as we cure the stupid by increasing his sensibility, we may believe that a more vivacious fancy may be promised to those who possess one when the mind and the body play together in one harmonious accord. Prescribe the bath, frictions, and fomentations, and though it seems a roundabout way, you get at the brains by his feet. A literary man, from long, sedentary habits, could not overcome his fits of melancholy, till his physician doubled his daily quantity of wine, and the learned Henry Stevens, after a severe aug, had such a disgust of books, the most beloved objects of his whole life, that the very thought of them excited terror for a considerable time. It is evident that the state of the body often indicates that of the mind. Insanity itself often results from some disorder in the human machine. Quote, what is this mind of which men appear so vain? exclaims Fleischer. If considered according to its nature, it is a fire which sickness and an accident most sensibly puts out. It is a delicate temperament, which soon grows disordered, a happy conformation of organs, which wear out, a combination and a certain motion of the spirits, which exhaust themselves. It is the most lively and the most subtle part of the soul which seems to grow old with the body. End quote. It is not wonderful that some have attributed such virtues to their system of diet, if it has been found productive of certain effects on the human body. Cornaro perhaps imagined more than he experienced, but Apollonius Tyanius, when he had the credit of holding an intercourse with the devil by his presumed gift of prophecy, defended himself from the accusation by attributing his clear and prescient views of things to the light ailments he lived on never indulging in a variety of food. Quote, this mode of life has produced such a perspicuity in my ideas that I see as in a glass things past and future. End quote. We may therefore agree with Bayes that, quote, for a sonnet to Amanda and the like, stewed prunes only, end quote, might be sufficient, but for a grand design, nothing less than a more formal and formidable dose. Camus, a French physician, who combined literature with science, the author of Abdecker, or the Art of Cosmetics, which he discovered in Exercise and Temperance, produced another fanciful work, written in 1753. La Médecine de l'Esprit. His conjectural cases are at least as numerous as his more positive facts for he is not wanting in imagination. He assures us that having reflected on the physical causes, which by differently modifying the body, varied also the dispositions of the mind, he was convinced that by employing these different causes, or by imitating their powers by art, we might, by means purely mechanical, affect the human mind, and correct the infirmities of the understanding and the will. He considered this principle only as the aurora of a brighter day. The great difficulty to overcome was to find out a method to root out the defects or the diseases of the soul, in the same manner as physicians cure a fluxion from the lungs, a dysentery, a dropsy, and all other infirmities, which seem only to attack the body. This indeed, he says, is enlarging the domain of medicine, by showing how the functions of intellect and the springs of volition are mechanical. The movements and passions of the soul, formerly restricted to abstract reasonings, are by this system reduced to simple ideas, insisting that material causes force the soul and body to act together. The defects of the intellectual operations depend on those of the organization, which may be altered or destroyed by physical causes. And he properly adds, that we are to consider that the soul is material while existing in matter because it is operated on by matter such is the theory of la medicine de l'esprit which though physicians will never quote may perhaps contain some facts worth their attention camus two little volumes seem to have been preceded by a medical discourse delivered in the academy of dijon in seventeen forty eight 
where the moralist compares the infirmities and vices of the mind to parallel diseases of the body we may safely consider some infirmities and passions of the mind as diseases and could they be treated as we do the bodily ones to which they bear an infinity this would be the great triumph of morals and medicine the passion of avarice resembles the thirst of dropsical patients that of envy is a slow wasting fever love is often frenzy and capricious and sudden restlessness epileptic fits there are moral disorders which at times spread like epidemical maladies through towns and countries and even nations there are hereditary vices and infirmities transmitted from the parent's mind as there are unquestionably such diseases of the body the son of a father of a hot and irritable temperament inherits the same quickness and warmth a daughter is often the counterpart of her mother morality could it be treated medicinally would require its prescriptions as all diseases have their specific remedies the great secret is perhaps discovered by camus that of operating on the mind by means of the body a recent writer seems to have been struck by these curious analogies mr haslam in his work on sound mind says page ninety quote, there seems to be a considerable similarity between the morbid state of the instruments of voluntary motion that is the body and certain affections of the mental powers that is the mind thus paralysis has its counterpart in the defects of recollection where the utmost endeavor to remember is ineffectually exerted tremor may be compared with incapability of fixing the attention and this involuntary state of muscles ordinarily subjected to the will also finds a parallel where the mind loses its influence in the train of thought and becomes subject to spontaneous intrusions as may be exemplified in reveries dreaming and some species of madness End quote. thus one philosopher discovers the analogies of the mind with the body and another of the body with the mind can we now hesitate to believe that such analogies exist and advancing one step farther trace in this reciprocal influence that a part of the soul is the body as the body becomes a part of the soul the most important truth remains undivulged and never will in this mental pharmacy but none is more clear than that which led to the view of this subject that in this mutual intercourse of body and mind the superior is often governed by the inferior others think the mind is more willfully outrageous than the body plutarch in his essays has a familiar illustration which he borrows from some philosopher more ancient than himself Quote, should the body sue the mind before a court of judicature for damages it would be found the mind would prove to have been a ruinous tenant to its landlord End quote. the sage of Charonia did not foresee the hint of descartes in the discovery of camus that by medicine we may alleviate or remove the diseases of the mind a practice which indeed has not yet been pursued by physicians though the moralists have been often struck by the close analogies of the mind with the body a work by the learned dom pernetti la cunoisse de l'âme morale parcelle de l'âme physique we are told is more fortunate in its title than its execution probably it is one of the many attempts to develop this imperfect and obscure truth which hereafter may become more obvious and be universally comprehended. End of section seventy four. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section seventy five of Curiosities of Literature, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2 by Isaac Disraeli. Psalm Singing. The history of psalm singing is a portion of the history of Reformation, of that great religious revolution which separated forever into two unequal divisions the establishment of Christianity. 
it has not perhaps been remarked that psalm singing or metrical psalms degenerated into those scandalous compositions which under the abused title of hymns are now used by some sects footnote it would be polluting these pages with ribaldry, obscenity, and blasphemy were I to give specimens of some hymns of the Moravians and the Methodists and some of the still lower sects. End of footnote. These are evidently the last disorders of that system of psalm singing which made some religious persons early oppose its practice. Even Sternhold and Hopkins, our first psalm inditers, says Honest Fuller, found their work afterwards met with some frowns in the faces of great clergymen. To this day, these opinions are not adjusted. Archbishop Secker observes that though the first Christians, from this passage in James verse 13, is any merry, let him sing psalms, made singing a constant part of their worship, and the whole congregation joined in it, yet afterwards the singers by profession, who had been prudently appointed to lead and direct them, by degrees usurped the whole performance. But at the Reformation, the people were restored to their rights. This revolutionary style is singular. One might infer by the expression of the people being restored to their rights that a mixed assembly, roaring out confused tunes, nasal, guttural, and sibilant, was a more orderly government of psalmody than when the executive power was consigned to the voices of those whom the archbishop had justly described as having been first prudently appointed to lead and direct them, and who, by their subsequent proceedings, evidently discovered what they might have safely conjectured, that such a universal suffrage, where every man was to have a voice, must necessarily end in clatter and chaos. Footnote. There is a rare tract entitled Singing of Psalmers, vindicated from the charge of novelty, in answer to Dr. Russell, Mr. Marlowe, etc., 1698. It furnishes numerous authorities to show that it was practiced by the primitive Christians on almost every occasion. I shall directly quote a remarkable passage. End of footnote. Thomas Wharton, however, regards the metrical psalms of Sternhold as a puritanic invention, and asserts that, notwithstanding it is said in their title page that they are set forth and allowed to be sung in all churches, they were never admitted by lawful authority. They were first introduced by the Puritans, from the Calvinists of Geneva, and afterwards continued by connivance. As a true poetical antiquary, Thomas Wharton condemns any modernization of the venerable text of the old Sternhold and Hopkins, which, by changing obsolete for familiar words, destroys the texture of the original style, and many stanzas, already too naked and weak, like a plain old Gothic edifice stripped of its few signatures of antiquity, have lost that little and almost only strength and support which they derive from ancient phrases. Such alterations, even if executed with prudence and judgment, only corrupt what they endeavour to explain, and exhibit a motley performance, belonging to no character of writing, and which contains more improprieties than those which it professes to remove. This forcible criticism is worthy of our poetical antiquary. The same feeling was experienced by Pasquier, when Marot, in his Rifacciamento of the Roman de la Rose, left some of the obsolete phrases while he got rid of others. Cette bigarure de langage vieux et moderne was with him writing no language at all. The same circumstance occurred abroad when they resolved to retouch and modernize the old French metrical version of the Psalms, which we are about to notice. It produced the same controversy and the same dissatisfaction. The Church of Geneva adopted an improved version, but the charm of the old one was wanting. To trace the history of modern medical psalmody, we must have recourse to Bale, who as a mere literary historian has accidentally preserved it. The inventor was a celebrated French poet, and the invention, though perhaps in its very origin inclining towards the abuse to which it was afterwards carried, was unexpectedly adopted by the austere Calvin and introduced into the Geneva discipline. It is indeed strange that while he was stripping religion not merely of its pageantry, but even of its decent ceremonies, this levelling reformer should have introduced this taste for singing psalms in opposition to reading psalms. On a parallel principle, says Thomas Wharton, and if any artificial aids to devotion were to be allowed, he might at least have retained the use of pictures in the church. 
but it was decreed that statues should be mutilated of their fair proportions and painted glass be dashed into pieces while the congregation were to sing calvin sought for proselytes among the rabble of a republic who can have no relish for the more elegant externals but to have made men sing in concert in the streets or at their work and merry or sad on all occasions to tickle the ear with rhymes and touch the heart with emotion was betraying no deficient knowledge of human nature it seems however that this project was adopted accidentally and was certainly promoted by the fine natural genius of clement marot the favoured bard of francis i that prince of poets and that poet of princes as he was quaintly but expressively dignified by his contemporaries marot is still an inimitable and true poet for he has written in a manner of his own with such marked felicity that he has left his name to a style of poetry called marotique the original la fontaine is his imitator marot delighted in the very forms of poetry as well as its subjects and its manner his life indeed took more shapes and indulged in more poetical licenses than even his poetry licentious in morals often in prison or at court or in the army or a fugitive he has left in his numerous little poems many a curious record of his variegated existence he was indeed very far from being devout when his friend the learned vatable the hebrew professor probably to reclaim a perpetual sinner from profane rhymes as marot was suspected of heresy confession and meagre days being his abhorrence suggested the new project of translating the psalms into french verse and no doubt assisted the bard traduit son rythme francais selon la vérité hébraïque the famous théodore beza was also his friend and prompter and afterwards his continuator marot published fifty-two psalms written in a variety of measures with the same style he had done his ballads and rondeaux he dedicated his work to the king of france comparing him with the royal hebrew and with a french compliment dieu le donna au peuple hébraïque dieu te devoit ce pensage au gallique he insinuates that in his version he had received assistance par les divins esprits qui ont sous toi hébreu langage appris nous sont jetés les psaumes en lumière clair et au sens de la forme première this royal dedication is more solemn than usual yet marot who was never grave but in prison soon recovered from this dedication to the king for on turning the leaf we find another aux dames de france wharton says of marot that he seems anxious to deprecate the raillery which the new tone of his versification was likely to incur and is embarrassed to find an apology for turning saint his embarrassments however terminate in a highly poetical fancy when will the golden age be restored exclaims this lady's psalmists quand n'auront plus de cour ni lieu les chansons de ce petit dieu à qui les peintres font des ailes ô oh, vous dames et demoiselles que dieu fait pour être son temple et faites sous mauvais exemple retentir et chambre et salle de chansons mondaines ou sales etc knowing continues the poet that songs that are silent about love can never please you here are some composed by love itself all here is love but more than mortal sing these at all times et les convertir et muer faisant vos lèvres remuer et vos doigts sur les espinettes pour dire sainte chansonnette marot then breaks forth with that enthusiasm which perhaps at first conveyed to the sullen fancy of the austere calvin the project he so successfully adopted and whose influence we are still witnessing ô bienheureux qui voir pourra fleurir le temps que l'on aura le laboureur à sa charrue le charretier parmi la rue et l'artisan en sa boutique avec un psaume ou cantique en son labeur se soulager heureux qui aura le berger et la bergère en bois estant faire que rocher et estant après eux chante la hauteur du saint nom de leur créateur commencez dame commencez le siècle doré avancez en chantant d'un cœur débonnaire de dans ce saint cancionnaire thrice happy day who shall behold and listen in that age of gold as by the plough the labourer strays and carmen mid the public ways and tradesmen in his shop shall swell their voice in psalm or canticle 
sing to solace toil again from woods shall come a sweeter strain shepherd and shepherdess shall vie in many a tender psalmody and the creator's name prolong as rock and stream return their song begin then ladies fair begin the atrian youth that knows no sin and with light heart that wants no wing sing from this holy songbook sing footnote in the curious tract already referred to the following quotation is remarkable the scene the fancy of marot pictured to him had anciently occurred st jerome in his seventeenth epistle to marcellus thus describes it in christian villages little else is to be heard but psalms for which way soever you turn yourself either you have the ploughman at his plough singing hallelujahs the weary brewer refreshing himself with a psalm or the vine dresser chanting forth somewhat of david's End of footnote. this holy song-book for the harpsichord or the voice was a gay novelty and no book was ever more eagerly received by all classes than marot's psalms in the fervour of that day they sold faster than the printers could take them off their presses but as they were understood to be songs and yet were not accompanied by music every one set them to favourite tunes commonly those of popular ballads each of the royal family and every nobleman chose a psalm or a song which expressed his own personal feelings adapted to his own tune the dauphin afterwards henry the second a great hunter when he went to the chase was singing ainsi qu'on vit le cerf bruire like as the heart desireth the water brooks there is a curious portrait of the mistress of henry the famous diane de poitiers recently published on which is inscribed this verse of the psalm on a portrait which exhibits diane in an attitude rather unsuitable to so solemn an application no reason could be found to account for this discordance perhaps the painter or the lady herself chose to adopt the favourite psalm of her royal lover proudly to designate the object of her love besides its double allusion to her name diane however in the first stage of their mutual attachment took du fond de ma pensée or from the depth of my heart the queen's favourite was ne veuille pas au sire me reprendre en ton ear that is rebuke me not in thy indignation which she sung to a fashionable jig antony king of navarre sung revenge moi prends la querelle or stand up o lord to revenge my quarrel to the air of a dance of poitou we may conceive the ardour with which this novelty was received for francis sent to charles v marot's collection who both by promises and presents encouraged the french bard to proceed with his version and entreating marot to send him as soon as possible confeti mini domino quoniam bonus because it was his favourite psalm and the spanish as well as french composers hastened to set the psalms of marot to music the fashion lasted for henry the second set one to an air of his own composing catherine de medici had her psalm and it seems that every one at court adopted some particular psalm for themselves which they often played on lutes and guitars etc singing psalms in verse was then one of the chief ingredients in the happiness of social life the universal reception of marot's psalms induced theodore beza to conclude the collection and ten thousand copies were immediately dispersed but these had the advantage of being set to music for we are told they were admirably fitted to the violin and other musical instruments and who was the man who had thus adroitly taken hold of the public feeling to give it this strong direction it was the solitary thaumaturgus the ascetic calvin who from the depth of his closet at geneva had engaged the finest musical composers who were no doubt warmed by the zeal of propagating his faith to form these simple and beautiful airs to assist the psalm singers at first this was not discovered and catholics as well as huguenots were solacing themselves on all occasions with this new music but when calvin appointed these psalms as set to music to be sung at his meetings and marot's formed an appendix to the catechism of geneva this put an end to all psalm singing for the poor catholics marot himself was forced to fly to geneva from the fulminations of the sorbonne and psalm singing became an open declaration of what the french called lutheranisme when it became with the reformed a regular part of their religious discipline the cardinal of lorraine succeeded in persuading the lovely patroness of the holy songbook diane de poitiers who at first was a psalm singer and a heretical reader of the bible to discountenance this new fashion 
he began by finding fault with the psalms of david and revived the amatory elegances of horace at that moment even the reading of the bible was symptomatic of lutheranism the Anne, who had given way to these novelties would have a french bible because the queen catherine de medici had one and the cardinal finding a bible on her table immediately crossed himself beat his breast and otherwise so well acted his part that having thrown the bible down and condemned it he remonstrated with the fair penitent that it was a kind of reading not adapted for her sex containing dangerous matters if she was uneasy in her mind she should hear two masses instead of one and rest contented with her paternosters and her primer which were not only devotional but ornamented with a variety of elegant forms from the most exquisite pencils of france such is the story drawn from a curious letter written by a huguenot and a former friend of catherine de medici and by which we may infer that the reformed religion was making considerable progress in the french court had the cardinal of lorraine not interfered by persuading the mistress and she the king and the king his queen at once to give up psalm singing and reading the bible this infectious frenzy of psalm singing as wharton describes it under the calvinistic preachers had rapidly propagated itself through germany as well as france it was admirably calculated to kindle the flame of fanaticism and frequently served as the trumpet to rebellion these energetic hymns of geneva excited and supported a variety of popular insurrections in the most flourishing cities of the low countries and what our poetical antiquary could never forgive fomented the fury which defaced many of the most beautiful and venerable churches of flanders at length it reached our island at that critical moment when it had first embraced the reformation and here its domestic history was parallel with its foreign except perhaps in the splendour of its success sternhold an enthusiast for the reformation was much offended says wharton at the lascivious ballads which prevailed among the courtiers and with a laudable design to check these indecencies he undertook to be our marot without his genius thinking thereby says our cynical literary historian anthony wood that the courtiers would sing them instead of their sonnets but did not only some few accepted they were practised by the puritans in the reign of elizabeth for shakespeare notices the puritan of his day singing psalms to hornpipes footnote mr dowes imagined that this alludes to a common practice at that time among the puritans of burlesquing the plain chant of the papists by adapting vulgar and ludicrous music to psalms and pious compositions illustrations of shakespeare one three hundred and fifty five mr dowes does not recollect his authority my idea differs may we not conjecture that the intention was the same which induced sternhold to versify the psalms to be sung instead of lascivious ballads and the most popular tunes came afterwards to be adopted that the singer might practise his favourite one as we find it occurred in france and a footnote and more particularly during the protectorate of cromwell on the same plan of accommodating them to popular tunes and jigs which one of them said were too good for the devil psalms were now sang at lord mayor's dinners and city feasts soldiers sung them on their march and at parade and few houses which had windows fronting the streets but had their evening psalms for a story had come down to us to record that the hypocritical brotherhood did not always care to sing unless they were heard footnote ed phillips in his satire against hypocrites sixteen eighty nine alludes to this custom of the pious citizens singing with woeful noise like a cracked saint's bell jarring in the steeple tom sternhold's wretched prick song to the people now they're at home and have their suppers eat when thomas cries the master come repeat and if the windows gaze upon the street to sing a psalm they hold it very meet end of footnote end of section seventy five Section 76 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2, by Isaac Disraeli. On the Ridiculous Titles Assumed by Italian Academies. 
the italians are a fanciful people who have often mixed a grain or two of pleasantry and even of folly with their wisdom this fanciful character betrays itself in their architecture in their poetry in their extemporary comedy and in their improvisatory but an instance not yet accounted for of this national levity appears in those denominations of exquisite absurdity given by themselves to their academies i have in vain inquired for any assignable reason why the most ingenious men and grave and illustrious personages cardinals and princes as well as poets scholars and artists in every literary city should voluntarily choose to burlesque themselves and their serious occupations by affecting mysterious or ludicrous titles as if it were carnival time and they had to support masquerade characters and accepting such titles as we find in the cant style of our own vulgar clubs the society of odd fellows and of eccentrics a principle so whimsical but systematic must surely have originated in some circumstance not hitherto detected a literary friend recently in an italian city exhausted by the scirocco entered a house whose open door and circular seats appeared to offer to passengers a refreshing sorbetto he discovered however that he had got into the academy of the chameleons where they met to delight their brothers and any spirito gentle they could nail to a recitation an invitation to join the academicians alarmed him for with some impatient prejudice against these little creatures vocal with prose rhyme and usually with odes and sonnets begged for or purloined for the occasion he waived all further curiosity and courtesy and has returned home without any information how these chameleons looked when changing their colours in an academia such literary institutions prevalent in italy are the spurious remains of those numerous academies which simultaneously started up in that country about the sixteenth century they assumed the most ridiculous denominations and a great number is registered by quadrio and tiraboschi whatever was their design one cannot fairly reproach them as menken in his charlatanaria eruditorum seems to have thought for pompous quackery neither can we attribute to their modesty their choice of senseless titles for to have degraded their own exalted pursuits was but folly literary history affords no parallel to this national absurdity of the refined italians who could have suspected that the most eminent scholars and men of genius were associates of the oziosi the fantastici the insensati why should genoa boast of her sleepy yiturbo of her obstinate siena of her insipids her blockheads and her thunderstruck and naples of her furiosi while maserata exults in her madmen chained both quadrio and tiraboschi cannot deny that these fantastical titles have occasioned these italian academies to appear very ridiculous to the ultramontani but these valuable historians are no philosophical thinkers they apologize for this bad taste by describing the ardor which was kindled throughout italy at the restoration of letters and the fine arts so that every one and even every man of genius were eager to enroll their names in these academies and prided themselves in bearing their emblems that is the distinctive arms each academy had chosen but why did they mystify themselves folly once become national is a vigorous plant which sheds abundant seed the consequence of having adopted ridiculous titles for these academies suggested to them many other characteristic fopperies at florence every brother of the umidi assumed the name of something aquatic or inequality pertaining to humidity one was called the frozen another the damp one was the pike another the swan and grassini the celebrated novelist is known better by the cognomen of la lasca the roach by which he whimsically designates himself among the humids i find among the insensati one man of learning taking the name of stordido insensato another tenembroso insensato the famous florentine academy of la crusca 
amidst their grave labors to sift and purify their language threw themselves headlong into this vortex of folly their title the academy of bran was a conceit to indicate their art of sifting but it required an italian prodigality of conceit to have induced these grave scholars to exhibit themselves in the burlesque scenery of a pantomimical academy for their furniture consists of a mill and a bakehouse a pulpit for the orator is a hopper while the learned director sits on a millstone the other seats have the forms of a miller's dossers or great panniers and the backs consist of the long shovels used in ovens the table is a baker's kneading trough and the academician who reads has half his body thrust out of a great bolting sack with i know not what else for their inkstands and portfolios but the most celebrated of these academies is that degli arcadi at rome who are still carrying on their pretensions much higher whoever aspires to be aggregated to these arcadian shepherds receives a personal name and a title but not the deeds of a farm picked out of a map of the ancient arcadia or its environs for arcadia itself soon became too small a possession for these partitioners of moonshine their laws modelled by the twelve tables of the ancient romans their language in the venerable majesty of their renowned ancestors and this erudite democracy dating by the grecian olympiads which crescambini their first custod or guardian most painfully adjusted to the vulgar era were designed that the sacred erudition of antiquity might for ever be present among these shepherds footnote crescambini at the close of la bellezza della vulgar poesia roma seventeen hundred end of footnote galdoni in his memoirs has given an amusing account of these honours he says he was presented with two diplomas the one was my charter of aggregation to the arcadi of rome under the name of polisseno the other gave me the investiture of the flagrian fields i was on this saluted by the whole assembly in chorus under the name of polisseno flagreo and embraced by them as a fellow shepherd and brother the arcadians are very rich as you may perceive my dear reader we possess estates in greece we watered them with our labours for the sake of reaping laurels and the turks sow them with grain and plant them with vines and laugh at both our titles and our songs when fontenelle became an arcadian they baptized the new pastor by their graceful diminutive fontenella allusive to the charm of his style and further they magnificently presented him with the entire isle of delos the late joseph walker an enthusiast for italian literature dedicated his memoir on italian tragedy to the countess spencer not inscribing it with his christian but his heathen name and the title of his arcadian estate ubanti tirinzio plain joseph walker in his masquerade dress with his arcadian signet of pan's reeds dangling in his title page was performing a character to which however well adapted not being understood he got stared at for his affectation we have lately heard of some licentious revellings of these arcadians in receiving a man of genius from our own country who himself composing italian rhyme had conceit enough to become a shepherd footnote history of the middle ages two five hundred and eighty four see also mr rose's letters from the north of italy volume one two hundred and four mr hallam has observed that such an institution as the society degli arcadi could at no time have endured public ridicule in england for a fortnight End of footnote. yet let us inquire before we criticise even this ridiculous society of the arcadians became a memorable literary institution and tiraboski has shown how it successfully arrested the bad taste which was then prevailing throughout italy recalling its muses to pure sources while the lives of many of its shepherds have furnished an interesting volume of literary history under the title of the illustrious arcadians 
crescambini and its founders had formed the most elevated conceptions of the society at its origin but poetical vaticinators are prophets only while we read their verses we must not look for that dry matter of fact the event predicted il vostro semi eterno occupera la terra ed i confini d'arcadia altra passando di non più visti gloriosi germi l'orio fecondera lito del conge e de simerari l'encacandi arini mr matthias has recently with warmth defended the original arcadia and the assumed character of its members which has been condemned as betraying their affectation he attributes to their modesty before the critics of the arcadia the pastori as they modestly styled themselves with crescambini for their conductor and with the adorato albano for their patron clement the eleventh all that was depraved in language and in sentiment fled and disappeared the strange taste for giving fantastical denominations to literary institutions grew into a custom though probably no one knew how the founders were always persons of rank or learning yet still accident or caprice created the mystifying title and invented those appropriate emblems which still added to the folly the arcadian society derived its title from a spontaneous conceit this assembly first held its meetings on summer evenings in a meadow on the banks of the tiber for the fine climate of italy promotes such assemblies in the open air in the recital of an eclogue an enthusiast amidst all he was hearing and all he was seeing exclaimed i seem at this moment to be in the arcadia of ancient greece listening to the pure and simple strains of its shepherds enthusiasm is contagious amidst susceptible italians and this name by inspiration and by acclamation was conferred on the society even more recently at florence the academia called the columbaria or the pigeon-house proves with what levity the italian's name a literary society the founder was the cavallero pazzi a gentleman who like morose abhorring noise chose for his study a garret in his palazzo it was indeed one of the old turrets which had not yet fallen in there he fixed his library and there he assembled the most ingenious florentines to discuss obscure points and to reveal their own contributions in this secret retreat of silence and philosophy to get to this cabinet it was necessary to climb a very steep and very narrow staircase which occasioned some facetious wit to observe that these literati were so many pigeons who flew every evening to their dovecote the cavallero pazzi to indulge this humour invited them to a dinner entirely composed of their little brothers in all the varieties of cookery the members after a hearty laugh assumed the title of the columbaria invented a device consisting of the top of a turret with several pigeons flying about it bearing an epigraph from dante quanto veder si puo by which they expressed their design not to apply themselves to any single object such facts sufficiently prove that some of the absurd or facetious denominations of these literary societies originated in accidental circumstances or in mere pleasantry but this will not account for the origin of those mystifying titles we have noticed for when grave men call themselves dolts or lunatics unless they are really so they must have some reason for laughing at themselves to attempt to develop this curious but obscure singularity in literary history we must go further back among the first beginnings of these institutions how were they looked on by the governments in which they first appeared these academies might perhaps form a chapter in the history of secret societies one not yet written but of which many curious materials lie scattered in history it is certain that such literary societies in their first origins have always excited the jealousy of governments but more particularly in ecclesiastical rome and the rival principalities of italy 
if two great nations like those of england and france had their suspicions and fears roused by a select assembly of philosophical men and either put them down by force or closely watched them this will not seem extraordinary in little despotic states we have accounts of some philosophical associations at home which were joined by sir philip sidney and sir walter raleigh but which soon got the odium of atheism attached to them and the establishment of the french academy occasioned some umbrage for a year elapsed before the parliament of paris would register their patent which was at length accorded by the political richelieu observing to the president that he should like the members according as the members liked him thus we have ascertained one principle that governments in those times looked on a new society with a political glance nor is it improbable that some of them combined an ostensible with a latent motive there is no want of evidence to prove that the modern romans from the thirteenth to the fifteenth century were too feelingly alive to their obscured glory and that they too frequently made invidious comparisons of their ancient republic with the pontifical government to revive rome with everything roman inspired such enthusiasts as rienzi and charmed the visions of petrarch at a period when ancient literature as if by a miracle was raising itself from its grave the learned were agitated by a correspondent energy not only was an estate sold to purchase a manuscript but the relic of genius was touched with a religious emotion the classical purity of cicero was contrasted with the barbarous idiom of the missal the glories of ancient rome with the miserable subjugation of its modern pontiffs and the metaphysical reveries of plato and what they term the enthusiasmus alexandrinus the dreams of the platonists seem to the fanciful italians more elevated than the humble and pure ethics of the gospels the vain and amorous eloisa could even censure the gross manners as it seemed to her of the apostles for picking the ears of corn in their walks and at their meals eating with unwashed hands touched by this mania of antiquity the learned affected to change their vulgar christian name by assuming the more classical ones of a junius brutus a pomponius or a julius or any other rusty name unwashed by baptism this frenzy for the ancient republic not only menaced the pontificate but their platonic or their pagan ardors seem to be striking at the foundation of christianity itself such were marcellus ficinus and that learned society who assembled under the medici pomponius latus who lived at the close of the fifteenth century not only celebrated by an annual festival the foundation of rome and raised altars to romulus but openly expressed his contempt for the christian religion which this visionary declared was only fit for barbarians but this extravagance and irreligion observes niceron were common with many of the learned of those times and this very pomponius was at length formally accused of the crime of changing the baptismal names of the young persons whom he taught for pagan ones this was the taste of the times says the author we have just quoted but it was imagined that there was a mystery concealed in these changes of names at this period these literary societies first appear one at rome had the title of academy and for its chief this very pomponius for he is distinguished as romane princeps academiae by his friend politian in the messalinea of that elegant scholar this was under the pontificate of paul the second the regular meetings of the academy soon excited the jealousy and suspicions of paul and gave rise to one of the most horrid persecutions and scenes of torture even to death in which these academicians were involved this closed with a decree of paul's that for the future no one should pronounce either seriously or in jest the very name of academy under the penalty of heresy the story is told by platina one of the sufferers in his life of paul the second 
and although this history may be said to bear the bruises of the wounded and dislocated body of the unhappy historian the facts are unquestionable and connected with our subject platina pomponius and many of their friends were suddenly dragged to prison on the first and second day torture was applied and many expired under the hands of their executioners you would have imagined says platina that the castle of st angelo was turned into the bull of phalaris so loud the hollow vault resounded with the cries of those miserable young men who were an honour to their age for genius and learning the torturers not satisfied though weary having racked twenty men in these two days of whom some died at length sent for me to take my turn the instruments of torture were ready i was stripped and the executioners put themselves to their work bionysius sat like another minos on a seat of tapestry work gay as at a wedding and while i hung on the rack in torment he played with a jewel which sanga had asking him who was the mistress which had given him this love token turning to me he asked why pomponio in a letter should call me holy father did the conspirators agree to make you pope pomponio i replied can best tell why he gave me this title for i know not at length having pleased but not satisfied himself with my tortures he ordered me to be let down that i might undergo tortures much greater in the evening i was carried half dead into my chamber but not long after the inquisitor having dined and being fresh in drink i was fetched again and the archbishop of spilatro was there they inquired of my conversations with malatesta i said it only concerned ancient and modern learning the military arts and the characters of illustrious men the ordinary subjects of conversation i was bitterly threatened by vianesius unless i confessed the truth on the following day and was carried back to my chamber where i was seized with such extreme pain that i had rather have died than endured the agony of my battered and dislocated limbs but now those who were accused of heresy were charged with plotting treason pomponius being examined why he changed the names of his friends he answered boldly that this was no concern of his judges or the pope it was perhaps out of respect for antiquity to stimulate to a virtuous emulation after we had now lain ten months in prison paul comes himself to the castle where he charged us among other things that we had disputed concerning the immortality of the soul and that we held the opinion of plato by disputing you call the being of a god in question this i said might be objected to all divines and philosophers who to make the truth appear frequently question the existence of souls and of god and of all separate intelligences st austin says the opinion of plato is like the faith of christians i followed none of the numerous heretical factions paul then accused us of being two great admirers of pagan antiquities yet none were more fond of them than himself for he collected all the statues and sarcophagi of the ancients to place in his palace and even affected to imitate on more than one occasion the pomp and charm of their public ceremonies while they were arguing mention happened to be made of the academy when the cardinal of san marco cried out that we were not academics but a scandal to the name and paul now declared that he would not have that term ever more mentioned under pain of heresy he left us in a passion and kept us two months longer in prison to complete the year as it seems he had sworn such is the interesting narrative of platina from which we may surely infer that if these learned men assembled for the communication of their studies inquiries suggested by the monuments of antiquity the two learned languages ancient authors and speculative points of philosophy these objects were associated with others which terrified the jealousy of modern rome some time after at naples appeared the two brothers john baptiste and john vincent porta those twin spirits the castor and pollux of the natural philosophy of that age and whose scenical museum delighted and awed 
by its optical illusions its treasure of curiosities and its natural magic all learned natives and foreigners their names are still famous and their treatises de humana physiognomia and magia naturalis are still opened by the curious who discover these children of philosophy wandering in the arcana of nature to them a world of perpetual beginnings these learned brothers united with the marquis of manso the friend of tasso in establishing an academy under the whimsical name degli oziosi the lazy which so ill described their intentions this academy did not sufficiently embrace the views of the learned brothers and then they formed another under their own roof which they appropriately named degli secreti the ostensible motive was that no one should be admitted into this interior society who had not signalized himself by some experiment or discovery it is clear that whatever they intended by the project the election of the members was to pass through the most rigid scrutiny and what was the consequence the court of rome again started up with all its fears and secretly obtaining information of some discussions which had passed in this academy degli secreti prohibited the porters from holding such assemblies or applying themselves to those illicit sciences whose amusements are criminal and turn us aside from the study of the holy scriptures it seems that one of the porters had delivered himself in the style of an ancient oracle but what was more alarming in this prophetical spirit several of his predictions have been actually verified the infallible court was in no want of a new school of prophecy baptiste de porta went to rome to justify himself and content to wear his head placed his tongue in the custody of his holiness and no doubt preferred being a member of the academia degli oziosi to that degli secreti to confirm this notion that these academies excited the jealousy of those despotic states of italy i find that several of them at florence as well as at siena were considered as dangerous meetings and in fifteen sixty eight the medici suddenly suppressed those of the insipids the shy the disheartened and others but more particularly the stunned gli entronati which excited loud laments we have also an account of an academy which calls itself the lanternists from the circumstance that their first meetings were held at night the academicians not carrying torches but only lanterns this academy indeed was at toulouse but evidently formed on the model of its neighbours in fine it cannot be denied that these literary societies or academies were frequently objects of alarm to the little governments of italy and were often interrupted by political persecution from all these facts i am inclined to draw an inference it is remarkable that the first italian academies were only distinguished by the simple name of their founders one was called the academy of pomponius latus another of panormita etc it was after the melancholy fate of the roman academy of latus which could not however extinguish that growing desire of creating literary societies in the italian cities from which the members derived both honour and pleasure that suddenly we discover these academies bearing the most fantastical titles i have not found any writer who has attempted to solve this extraordinary appearance in literary history and the difficulty seems great because however frivolous or fantastical the titles they assumed their members were illustrious for rank and genius Terabaski, aware of this difficulty can only express his astonishment at the absurdity and his vexation at the ridicule to which the italians have been exposed by the coarse jokes of mencinius in his charlatanaria eruditorum footnote c tiraboski volume seven chapter four academy and quadrios della storia e della ragione dogni poesia in the immense receptacle of these seven quarter volumes printed with a small type the curious may consult the voluminous index art academia End of footnote i conjecture that the invention of these ridiculous titles for literary societies was an attempt to throw a sportive veil over meetings which had alarmed the papal and the other petty courts of italy and to quiet their fears and turn aside their political wrath 
they implied the innocence of their pursuits by the jocularity with which the members treated themselves and were willing that others should treat them this otherwise inexplicable national levity of so refined a people has not occurred in any other country because the necessity did not exist anywhere but in italy in france in spain and in england the title of the ancient academus was never profaned by an adjunct which systematically degraded and ridiculed its venerable character and its illustrious members long after this article was finished i had an opportunity of consulting an eminent italian whose name is already celebrated in our country il signor ugo foscolo footnote ugo foscolo was born in padua where he achieved an early success as an author he entered the italian army in eighteen o five but soon quitted it and became professor of literature in the university of pavia but his lectures alarmed napoleon by their boldness of speech and he suppressed the professorship he came to england in eighteen fifteen and was exceedingly well received he wrote much in the edinburgh and quarterly reviews besides publishing several books he died in eighteen twenty seven and is buried at chiswick End of footnote. his decision ought necessarily to outweigh mine but although it is incumbent on me to put the reader in possession of the opinion of a native of his high acquirements it is not as easy for me on this obscure and curious subject to relinquish my own conjecture il signor foscolo is of opinion that the origin of the fantastical titles assumed by the italian academies entirely arose from a desire of getting rid of the air of pedantry and to insinuate that their meetings and their works were to be considered merely as sportive relaxations and an idle business this opinion may satisfy an italian and this he may deem a sufficient apology for such absurdity but when scarlet robes and cowled heads laureated bards and monseigneurs and cavalleros baptize themselves in a public assembly blockheads or madmen we ultramontanes out of mere compliment to such great and learned men would suppose that they had their good reasons and that in this there must have been something more than meets the ear after all i would almost flatter myself that our two opinions are not so wide of each other as they at first seem to be end of section seventy six section seventy seven of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli on the hero of hudibras butler vindicated that great original the author of hudibras has been recently censured for exposing to ridicule the sir samuel luke under whose roof he dwelt in the grotesque character of his hero the knowledge of the critic in our literary history is not curious he appears to have advanced no further than to have taken up the first opinion he found but this served for an attempt to blacken the moral character of butler having lived says our critic in the family of sir samuel luke one of cromwell's captains at the very time he planned the hudibras of which he was pleased to make his kind and hospitable patron the hero we defy the history of whiggism to match this anecdote as if it could not be matched whigs and tories are as like as two eggs when they are wits and satirists their friends too often become their victims if sir samuel resembled that renowned personification the ridicule was legitimate and unavoidable when the poet had espoused his cause and espoused it too from the purest motive a detestation of political and fanatical hypocrisy footnote in a pamphlet entitled mercurius manipius the loyal satirist or hudibras in prose published in sixteen eighty two and said to be written by an unknown hand in the time of the late rebellion but never till now published is the following curious notice of sir samuel which certainly seems to point him out as the prototype of hudibras 
whose back or rather burthen showed as if it stooped with its own load the author is speaking of cromwell and says i wonder how sir samuel luke and he should clash for they are both cubs of the same ugly litter this urchin is as ill-carved as that goblin painted the grandam bear sure had blistered her tongue and so left him unlicked he looks like a snail with his house upon his back or the spirit of the militia with a natural snapsack and may serve both for tinker and budget too nature intended him to play at bowls and therefore clapped a bias upon him one would think a mole had crept into his carcass before tis laid in the churchyard and rooted in it he looks like the visible tie of aeneas bolstering up his father or some beggar woman endorsed with her whole litter and with a child behind End of footnote comic satirists whatever they may allege to the contrary will always draw largely and most truly from their own circle after all it does not appear that sir samuel sat for sir hudibras although from the hiatus still in the poem at the end of part one canto one his name would accommodate both the metre and the rhyme but who said warburton ever compared a person to himself butler might aim a sly stroke at sir samuel by hinting to him how well he resembled hudibras but with a remarkable forbearance he has left posterity to settle the affair which is certainly not worth their while but warburton tells that a friend of butler's had declared the person was a devonshire man one sir harry rosewell of ford abbey in that county there is a curious life of our learned wit in the great general dictionary the writer probably dr birch made the most authentic researches from the contemporaries of butler or their descendants and from charles longville the son of butler's great friend he obtained much of the little we possess the writer of this life believes that sir samuel was the hero of butler and rests his evidence on the hiatus we have noticed but with the candour which becomes the literary historian he has added the following marginal note whilst this sheet was at press i was assured by mr longville that sir samuel luke is not the person ridiculed under the name of hudibras it would be curious after all should the prototype of hudibras turn out to be one of the heroes of the Roliad a circumstance which had it been known to the co-partnership of that comic epic would have furnished a fine episode and a memorable hero to their line of descent when butler wrote his hudibras one colonel roll a devonshire man lodged with him and was exactly like his description of the knight whence it is highly probable that it was this gentleman and not sir samuel luke whose person he had in his eye the reason that he gave for calling his poem hudibras was because the name of the old tutelar saint of devonshire was hugh de bras i find this in the grub street journal january seventeen thirty one a periodical paper conducted by two eminent literary physicians under the appropriate names of bavius and mavius footnote bavius and mavius were dr martin the well-known author of the dissertation on the aeneid of virgil and dr russell another learned physician as his publications attest it does great credit to their taste that they were the hebdomadal defenders of pope from the attacks of the heroes of the dunciad End of footnote and which for some time enlivened the town with the excellent design of ridiculing silly authors and stupid critics it is unquestionably proved by the confession of several friends of butler that the prototype of sir hugh de bras was a devonshire man and if sir hugh de bras be the old patron saint of devonshire which however i cannot find in prince's or in fuller's worthies footnote, there is great reason to doubt the authenticity of this information concerning a devonshire tutelar saint 
mr charles butler has kindly communicated the researches of a catholic clergyman residing at exeter who having examined the voluminous registers of the see of exeter and numerous manuscripts and records of the diocese cannot trace that any such saint was particularly honoured in the county it is lamentable that ingenious writers should invent fictions for authorities but with the hope that the present authors have not done this i have preserved this apocryphal tradition in the footnote this discovers the suggestion which led butler to the name of his hero burlesquing the new saint by pairing him with the chivalrous saint of the county hence like the knight of old did sir knight abandon dwelling and out he rode a kernelling this origin of the name is more appropriate to the character of the work than deriving it from the sir hudibras of spencer with whom there exists no similitude it is as honourable as it is extraordinary that such was the celebrity of hudibras that the workman's name was often confounded with the work itself the poet was once better known under the name of hudibras than of butler old southern calls him hudibras butler and if any one would read the most copious life we have of this great poet in the great general dictionary he must look for a name he is not accustomed to find among english authors that of hudibras one fact is remarkable that like cervantes and unlike rabelais and sterne butler in his great work has not sent down to posterity a single passage of indecent ribaldry though it was written amidst a court which would have got such by heart and in an age in which such trash was certain of popularity we know little more of butler than we do of shakespeare and of spencer longville the devoted friend of our poet has unfortunately left no reminiscences of the departed genius whom he so intimately knew and who bequeathed to longville the only legacy a neglected poet could leave all his manuscripts and to his care though not to his spirit we are indebted for butler's remains his friend attempted to bury him with the public honours he deserved among the tombs of his brother bards in westminster abbey but he was compelled to consign the bard to an obscure burial place in paul's covent garden footnote he was buried outside the church in the angle at the northwest corner where the wall originally stood which bounded the churchyard End of footnote many years after when alderman barber raised an inscription to the memory of butler in westminster abbey others were desirous of placing one over the poet's humble gravestone this probably excited some competition and the following fine one attributed to dennis has perhaps never been published if it be dennis's it must have been composed in one of his most lucid moments near this place lies interred the body of mr samuel butler author of hudibras he was a whole species of poets in one admirable in a manner in which no one else has been tolerable a manner which began and ended in him in which he knew no guide and has found no followers footnote a monument was put up in the church in seventeen eighty six by a subscription among the parishioners it exhibits a bust of butler and a rhyming inscription in very bad taste End of footnote to this brief article i add a proof that that fanaticism which is branded by our immortal butler can survive the castigation folly is sometimes immortal as nonsense is sometimes irrefutable ancient follies revive and men repeat the same unintelligible jargon just as contagion keeps up the plague in turkey by lying hid in some obscure corner till it breaks out afresh recently we have seen a notable instance where one of the school to which we are alluding declares of shakespeare that it would have been happy if he had never been born for that thousands will look back with incessant anguish on the guilty delight which the plays of shakespeare ministered to them footnote see quarterly review volume three page one hundred and eleven where i found this quotation justly reprobated End of footnote. 
such is the anathema of shakespeare we have another of butler in an historic defence of experimental religion in which the author contends that the best men have experienced the agency of the holy spirit in an immediate illumination from heaven he furnishes his historic proofs by a list from abel to lady huntingdon the author of hudibras is denounced one samuel butler a celebrated buffoon in the abandoned reign of charles the second wrote a mock heroic poem in which he undertook to burlesque the pious puritan he ridicules all the gracious promises by comparing the divine illumination to an ignis fatuus and dark lantern of the spirit footnote this work published in seventeen ninety five is curious for the materials the writer's reading has collected End of footnote such are the writers whose ascetic spirit is still descending among us from the monkery of the deserts adding poignancy to the very ridicule they would annihilate the satire which we deemed obsolete we find still applicable to contemporaries the first part of hudibras is the most perfect that was the rich fruit of matured meditation of wit of learning and of leisure a mind of the most original powers had been perpetually acted on by some of the most extraordinary events and persons of political and religious history butler had lived amidst scenes which might have excited indignation and grief but his strong contempt of the actors could only supply ludicrous images and caustic raillery yet once when villainy was at its zenith his solemn tones were raised to reach it footnote the case of king charles i truly stated against john cook master of gray's inn in butler's remains End of footnote the second part was precipitated in the following year an interval of fourteen years was allowed to elapse before the third and last part was given to the world but then everything had changed the poet the subject and the patron the old theme of the sectorists had lost its freshness and the cavaliers with their royal libertine had become as obnoxious to public decency as the tartuffes butler appears to have turned aside and to have given an adverse direction to his satirical arrows the slavery and dotage of hudibras to the widow revealed the voluptuous epicurean who slept on his throne dissolved in the arms of his mistresses the enchanted bower and the amorous suit of hudibras reflected the new manners of this wretched court and that butler had become the satirist of the party whose cause he had formerly so honestly espoused is confirmed by his remains where among other nervous satires is one on the licentious age of charles the second contrasted with the puritanical one that preceded it this then is the greater glory of butler that his high and indignant spirit equally satirized the hypocrites of cromwell and the libertines of charles end of section seventy seven section seventy eight of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli shenstone's schoolmistress the inimitable schoolmistress of shenstone is one of the felicities of genius but the purpose of this poem has been entirely misconceived johnson acknowledging this charming effusion to be the most pleasing of shenstone's productions observes i know not what claim it has to stand among the moral works the truth is that it was intended for quite a different class by the author and dodsley the editor of his works must have strangely blundered in designating it a moral poem 
it may be classed with a species of poetry till recently rare in our language and which we sometimes find among the italians in their rima piace voli or poesi burlesca which do not always consist of low humour in a facetious style with jingling rhymes to which form we attach our idea of a burlesque poem there is a refined species of ludicrous poetry which is comic yet tender lusory yet elegant and with such a blending of the serious and the facetious that the result of such a poem may often among its other pleasures produce a sort of ambiguity so that we do not always know whether the writer is laughing at his subject or whether he is to be laughed at our admirable whistlecraft met this fate footnote prospectus and specimen of an intended national work by william and robert whistlecraft of stowe market in suffolk harness and collar makers intended to comprise the most interesting particulars relating to king arthur and his round table the real author of mr whistlecraft's specimen was the right hon j hookham frere who has the merit of having first introduced the italian burlesque style into our literature lord byron composed his beppo confessedly after this example it is he writes a humorous poem in and after the excellent manner of mr whistlecraft who published this specimen only which was little read End of footnote. the schoolmistress of shenstone has been admired for its simplicity and tenderness not for its exquisitely ludicrous turn this discovery i owe to the good fortune of possessing the edition of the schoolmistress which the author printed under his own directions and to his own fancy footnote the original edition was printed in seventeen fifty seven without engravings they occur only in that which is described in our text End of footnote. to this piece of ludicrous poetry as he calls it lest it should be mistaken he added a ludicrous index purely to show fools that i am in jest but the fool his subsequent editor who i regret to say was robert dodsley thought proper to suppress this amusing ludicrous index and the consequence is as the poet foresaw that his aim has been mistaken the whole history of this poem and this edition may be traced in the printed correspondence of shenstone our poet had pleased himself by ornamenting a sixpenny pamphlet with certain seemly designs of his and for which he came to town to direct the engraver he appears also to have intended accompanying it with the deformed portrait of my old school dame sarah lloyd the frontispiece to this first edition represents the thatched house of his old schoolmistress and before it is the birch tree with the sun setting and gilding the scene he writes on this i have the first sheet to correct upon the table i have laid aside the thoughts of fame a good deal in this unpromising scheme and fixed them upon the landscape which is engraving the red letter which i propose and the fruit piece which you see being the most seemly ornaments of the first sixpenny pamphlet that was ever so highly honoured i shall incur the same reflection with ogleby of having nothing good but my decorations i expect that in your neighbourhood and in warwickshire there should be twenty of my poems sold i print it myself i am pleased with mine's engravings on the publication shenstone has opened his idea on its poetical characteristic i dare say it must be very incorrect for i have added eight or ten stanzas within this fortnight but inaccuracy is more excusable in ludicrous poetry than in any other if it strikes any it must be merely people of taste for people of wit without taste which comprehends the larger part of the critical tribe will unavoidably despise it i have been at some pains to recover myself from a f five 
asterisk 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 misfortune of mere childishness little charm of placid mien etc i have added a ludicrous index purely to show fools that i am in jest and my motto o qua so habitabilis illustrat orus maxima principum is calculated for the same purpose you cannot conceive how large the number is of those that mistake burlesque for the very foolishness it exposes which observation i made once at the rehearsal at tom thumb at chrono hotonthologus all which are pieces of elegant humour i have some mind to pursue this caution further and advertise it the schoolmistress etc a very childish performance everybody knows no warum more but if a person seriously calls this or rather burlesque a childish or low species of poetry he says wrong for the most regular and formal poetry may be called trifling folly and weakness in comparison of what is written with a more manly spirit in ridicule of it this edition is now lying before me with its splendid red letter its seemly designs and what is more precious its index shenstone who had greatly pleased himself with his graphical inventions at length found that his engraver mind had sadly bungled with the poet's ideal vexed and disappointed he writes i have been plagued to death about the ill execution of my designs nothing is certain in london but expense which i can ill bear the truth is that what is placed in the landscape over the thatched house and the birch tree is like a falling monster rather than a setting sun but the fruit piece at the end the grapes the plums the melon and the catherine pears mr mind has made sufficiently tempting this edition contains only twenty-eight stanzas which were afterwards enlarged to thirty-five several stanzas have been omitted and they have also passed through many corrections and some improvements which show that shenstone had more judgment and felicity in severe correction than perhaps is suspected some of these i will point out footnote i have usually found the schoolmistress printed without numbering the stanzas to enter into the present view it will be necessary for the reader to do this himself with a pencil mark End of footnote. in the second stanza the first edition has in every mart that stands on britain's isle in every village less revealed to fame dwells there in cottage known about a mile a matron old whom we schoolmistress name improved thus in every village marked with little spire embowered in trees and hardly known to fame there dwells in lowly shed and mean attire a matron old whom we schoolmistress name the eighth stanza in the first edition runs the gown which o'er her shoulders thrown she had was russet stuff who knows not russet stuff great comfort to her mind that she was clad in texture of her own all strong and tough nay did she e'er complain nay deem it rough etc more elegantly descriptive is the dress as now delineated a russet stole was o'er her shoulders thrown a russet kirtle fenced the nipping air twas simple russet but it was her own twas her own country bred the flock so fair twas her own labour did the fleece prepare etc the additions made to the first edition consist of the eleven twelve thirteen fourteen and fifteenth stanzas in which are so beautifully introduced the herbs and garden stores and the psalmody of the schoolmistress the twenty-ninth and thirtieth stanzas were also subsequent insertions but those lines which give so original a view of genius in its infancy a little bench of heedless bishops here and there a chancellor in embryo etc were printed in seventeen forty two and i cannot but think that the far-famed stanza in gray's elegy where he discovers men of genius in peasants 
as shenstone has in children was suggested by this original conception some mute inglorious milton here may rest some cromwell guiltless of his country's blood is to me a congenial thought with an echoed turn of expression of the lines from the school mistress i shall now restore the ludicrous index and adapt it to the stanzas of the later edition introduction stanza one the subject proposed two a circumstance in the situation of the mansion of early discipline discovering the surprising influence of the connection of ideas three a simile introducing a deprecation of the joyless effects of bigotry and superstition four some peculiarities indicative of a country school with a short sketch of the sovereign presiding over it five some account of her nightcap apron and a tremendous description of her birchen sceptre six a parallel instance of the advantages of legal government with regard to children and the wind seven her gown eight her titles and punctilious nicety in the ceremonious assertion of them a digression concerning her hands presumptuous behaviour with a circumstance tending to give the cautious reader a more accurate idea of the officious diligence and economy of an old woman ten a view of this rural potentate as seated in her chair of state conferring honours distributing bounties and dispersing proclamations sixteen her policies seventeen the action of the poem commences with a general summons follows a particular description of the artful structure decoration and fortifications of an horn bible eighteen a surprising picture of sisterly affection by way of episode twenty twenty one a short list of the methods now in use to avoid a whipping which nevertheless follows twenty two the force of example twenty three a sketch of the particular symptoms of obstinacy as they discover themselves in a child with a simile illustrating a blubbered face twenty four twenty five twenty six a hint of great importance twenty seven the piety of the poet in relation to that school dame's memory who had the first formation of a certain patriot this stanza has been left out in the later editions it refers to the duke of argyle the secret connection between whipping and rising in the world with a view as it were through a perspective of the same little folk in the highest posts and reputation twenty eight an account of the nature of an embryo fox-hunter another stanza omitted a deviation to an huckster's shop thirty two which being continued for the space of three stanzas gives the author an opportunity of paying his compliments to a particular county which he gladly seizes concluding his piece with respectful mention of the ancient and loyal city of shrewsbury End of section seventy eight Section 79 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Panama. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2, by Isaac Disraeli. Ben Johnson on Translation. I have discovered a poem by this great poet which has escaped the researches of all his editors prefixed to a translation translation is the theme with us an unvalued art because our translators have usually been the jobbers of booksellers but no inglorious one among our french and italian rivals in this poem if the reader's ear be guided by the compressed sense of the mass of lines he may feel a rhythm which should they be read like our modern meter he will find wanting here the fullness of the thoughts forms their own cadences the mind is musical as well as the ear one verse running into another and the sense often closing in the middle of a line is the club of hercules 
Dryden sometimes succeeded in it, Churchill abused it, and Cowper attempted to revive it. Great force of thought only can wield this verse. On the author, work, and translator prefixed to the translation of Matteo Aleman's Spanish Rogue, 1623. Who tracks this author's or translator's pen shall find, that either hath read books and men, to say but one were single. Then it chimes when the old words do speak on the new times, as in this Spanish Proteus, who, though writ but in one tongue, was formed with the world's wit, and hath the noblest mark of a good book, that an ill man dares not securely look upon it, but will loathe, or let it pass, as a deformed faith doth a true glass. Such books deserve translators of like coat, as was the genius wherewith they were wrote. And this hath met that one, and may be stilled more than the foster father of this child, for though Spain gave him his first heir and vogue he would be called, henceforth, the English rogue, but that he's too well suited in a cloth finer than was his Spanish, if my oath will be received in court, if not, what I hath clothed him so. Here's all I can supply to your desert who have done it, friend. And this fair emulation and no envy is, when you behold me, wish myself, the man that would have done that which you only can. Ben Jonson. The translator of Guzman was James Mabe, which he disguised under the Spanish pseudonym of Diego Puede Ser, Diego for James, and Puede Ser for Mabe, or Maybe. He translated, with the same spirit as his Guzman, Celestina, or the Spanish Baud, that singular tragicomedy, a version still more remarkable. He had resided a considerable time in Spain, and was a perfect master of both languages. A rare talent in a translator, and the consequence is that he is a translator of genius. End of section 79section 80 of curiosities of literature volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org curiosities of literature volume 2 by isaac disraeli the loves of the lady arabella footnote Long after this article was composed, Miss Aiken published her Court of James I. That agreeable writer has written her popular volumes without wasting the bloom of life in the dust of libraries, and our female historian has not occasioned me to alter a single sentence in these researches. End of footnote where london's tower its turrets show so stately by the thames's side fair arabella child of woe for many a day had sat and sighed and as she heard the waves arise and as she heard the bleak winds roar as fast did heave her heartfelt sighs and still so fast her tears did pour arabella stuart in evans's old ballads probably written by mickle the name of arabella stuart mr lodge observes is scarcely mentioned in history the whole life of this lady seems to consist of secret history which probably we cannot now recover the writers who have ventured to weave together her loose and scattered story are ambiguous and contradictory how such slight domestic incidents as her life consisted of could produce results so greatly disproportioned to their apparent cause may always excite our curiosity her name scarcely ever occurs without raising that sort of interest which accompanies mysterious events and more particularly when we discover that this lady is so frequently alluded to by her foreign contemporaries the historians of the lady arabella have fallen into the grossest errors her chief historian has committed a violent injury on her very person which in the history of a female is not the least important 
in hastily consulting two passages relative to her he applied to the lady arabella the defective understanding and headstrong dispositions of her aunt the countess of shrewsbury and by another misconception of a term as i think asserts that the lady arabella was distinguished neither for beauty nor intellectual qualities footnote morant in the biographia britannica this gross blunder has been detected by mr lodge the other i submit to the reader's judgment a contemporary letter-writer alluding to the flight of arabella and seymour which alarmed the scottish so much more than the english party tells us among other reasons of the little danger of the political influence of the parties themselves over the people that not only their pretensions were far removed but he adds they were ungraceful both in their persons and their houses morant takes the term ungraceful in its modern acceptation but in the style of that day i think ungraceful is opposed to gracious in the eyes of the people meaning that their persons and their houses were not considerable to the multitude would it not be absurd to apply ungraceful in its modern sense to a family or house and had any political danger been expected assuredly it would not have been diminished by the want of personal grace in these lovers i do not recollect any authority for the sense of ungraceful in opposition to gracious but a critical and literary antiquary has sanctioned my opinion in the footnote this authoritative decision perplexed the modern editor kippis whose researches were always limited kippis had gleaned from oldys's precious manuscripts a single note which shook to its foundations the whole structure before him and he had also found in ballard to his utter confusion some hints that the lady arabella was a learned woman and of a poetical genius though even the writer himself who had recorded this discovery was at a loss to ascertain the fact it is amusing to observe honest george ballard in the same dilemma as honest andrew kippis this lady he says was not more distinguished for the dignity of her birth than celebrated for her fine parts and learning and yet he adds in all the simplicity of his ingenuousness i know so little in relation to the two last accomplishments that i should not have given her a place in these memoirs had not mr evelyn put her in his list of learned women and mr phillips milton's nephew introduced her among his modern poetesses the lady arabella for by that name she is usually noticed by her contemporaries rather than by her maiden name of stuart or by her married one of seymour as she latterly subscribed herself was by her affinity with james i and our elizabeth placed near the throne too near it seems for her happiness and quiet footnote she was the only child of charles stuart fifth earl of lennox by elizabeth daughter of sir william cavendish of hardwick in derbyshire and is supposed to have been born in fifteen seventy seven her father unhappily for her was of the royal blood both of england and scotland for he was a younger brother of king henry father of james the sixth and great-grandson through his mother who was daughter of margaret queen of scots to our henry the seventh such is lodge's account of this illustrious misfortune which made the life of a worthy lady wretched in the footnote in their common descent from margaret the elder daughter of henry the seventh she was cousin to the scottish monarch but born an englishwoman which gave her some advantage in a claim to the throne of england her double relation to royalty says mr lodge was equally obnoxious to the jealousy of elizabeth and the timidity of james and they secretly dreaded the supposed danger of her having a legitimate offspring yet james himself then unmarried proposed for the husband of the lady arabella one of her cousins lord esme stuart whom he had created duke of lennox and designed for his heir the first thing we hear of the lady arabella concerns a marriage marriages are the incidents of her life and the fatal event which terminated it was a marriage such was the secret spring on which her character and her misfortunes revolved 
This proposed match was desirable to all parties, but there was one greater than them all who forbade the bands. Elizabeth interposed. She imprisoned the Lady Arabella and would not deliver her up to the king, of whom she spoke with asperity and even with contempt. Footnote. A circumstance which we discover by a Spanish memorial when our James I was negotiating with the cabinet of Madrid, he complains of Elizabeth's treatment of him, that the queen refused to give him his father's estate in England, nor would deliver up his uncle's daughter Arabella to be married to the Duke of Lennox, at which time the queen, uso palabras muy asperas y de mucho desprecia contra el dico re desascocia, she used harsh words expressing much contempt of the king winwood's memorials one four in the footnote the greatest infirmity of elizabeth was her mysterious conduct respecting the succession to the english throne her jealousy of power her strange unhappiness and the dread of personal neglect made her averse to see a successor in her court or even to hear of a distant one in a successor she could only view a competitor camden tells us that she frequently observed that most men neglected the setting sun and this melancholy presentiment of personal neglect this political coquette not only lived to experience but even this circumstance of keeping the succession unsettled miserably disturbed the queen on her deathbed her ministers it appears harassed her when she was lying speechless a remarkable circumstance which has hitherto escaped the knowledge of her numerous historians and which i shall take an opportunity of disclosing in this work elizabeth leaving a point so important always problematical raised up the very evil she so greatly dreaded it multiplied the aspirants while every party humoured itself by selecting its own claimant and none more busily than the continental powers one of the most curious is the project of the pope who intending to put aside james i on account of his religion formed a chimerical scheme of uniting arabella with a prince of the house of savoy the pretext for without a pretext no politician moves was their descent from a bastard of our edward the fourth the duke of parma was however married but the pope in his infallibility turned his brother the cardinal into the duke's substitute by secularizing the churchman in that case the cardinal would then become king of england in right of this lady provided he obtained the crown footnote see a very curious letter the two hundred and ninety ninth of cardinal dosa volume five the catholic interest expected to facilitate the conquest of england by joining their armies with those of arabelle and the commentator writes that this english lady had a party consisting of all those english who had been the judges or the avowed enemies of mary of scotland the mother of james the first in the footnote we might conjecture from this circumstance that arabella was a catholic and so mr butler has recently told us but i know of no other authority than dodd the catholic historian who has inscribed her name among his party parsons the wily jesuit was so doubtful how the lady when young stood disposed towards catholicism that he describes her religion to be as tender green and flexible as is her age and sex and to be wrought hereafter and settled according to future events and times yet in sixteen eleven when she was finally sent into confinement one well informed of court affairs writes that the lady arabella hath not been found inclinable to popery even henry the fourth of france was not unfriendly to this papistical project of placing an italian cardinal on the english throne it had always been the state interest of the french cabinet to favour any scheme which might preserve the realms of england and scotland as separate kingdoms the manuscript correspondence of charles the ninth with his ambassador at the court of london which i have seen tends solely to this great purpose and perhaps it was her french and spanish allies which finally hastened the political martyrdom of the scottish mary thus we have discovered two chimerical husbands of the lady arabella 
the pretensions of this lady to the throne had evidently become an object with speculating politicians and perhaps it was to withdraw herself from the embarrassments into which she was thrown that according to de tu she intended to marry a son of the earl of northumberland but to the jealous terror of elizabeth an english earl was not an object of less magnitude than a scotch duke this is the third shadowy husband when james i ascended the english throne there existed an anti-scottish party hardly had the northern monarch entered into the land of promise when his southern throne was shaken by a foolish plot which one writer calls a state riddle it involved raleigh and unexpectedly the lady arabella the scottish monarch was to be got rid of and arabella was to be crowned some of these silly conspirators having written to her requesting letters to be addressed to the king of spain she laughed at the letter she received and sent it to the king thus for a second time was arabella to have been queen of england this occurred in sixteen o three but was followed by no harsh measures from james i in the following year sixteen o four i have discovered that for the third time the lady was offered a crown a great ambassador is coming from the king of poland whose chief errand is to demand my lady arabella in marriage for his master so may your princess of the blood grow a great queen and then we shall be safe from the danger of missuperscribing letters footnote this manuscript letter from william earl of pembroke to gilbert earl of shrewsbury is dated from hampton court october three sixteen o four sloan manuscripts four one six one end of footnote this last passage seems to allude to something what is meant by the danger of missuperscribing letters if this royal offer were ever made it was certainly forbidden can we imagine the refusal to have come from the lady who we shall see seven years afterwards complain that the king had neglected her in not providing her with a suitable match it was at this very time that one of those butterflies who quiver on the fair flowers of a court writes that my lady arabella spends her time in lecture reading etc and she will not hear of marriage indirectly there were speeches used in the recommendation of count maurice who pretendeth to be duke of gildress i dare not attempt her footnote lodge's illustrations of british history three two eighty six it is curious to observe that this letter by w fowler is dated on the same day as the manuscript letter i have just quoted and it is directed to the same earl of shrewsbury so that the earl must have received in one day accounts of two different projects of marriage for his niece this shows how much arabella engaged the designs of foreigners and natives will fowler was a rhyming and fantastical secretary to the queen of james the first End of footnote. here we find another princely match proposed thus far to the lady arabella crowns and husbands were like a fairy banquet seen at moonlight opening on her sight impalpable and vanishing at the moment of approach arabella from certain circumstances was a dependent on the king's bounty which flowed very unequally often reduced to great personal distress we find by her letters that she prayed for present money though it should not be annually i have discovered that james at length granted her a pension the royal favours however were probably limited to her good behaviour footnote two letters of arabella on distress of money are preserved by ballard the discovery of a pension i made in sir julius caesar's manuscripts where one is mentioned of sixteen hundred pounds to the lady arabella sloane manuscripts four one six zero mr lodge has shown that the king once granted her the duty on oats End of footnote. from sixteen o four to sixteen o eight is a period which forms a blank leaf in the story of arabella in this last year this unfortunate lady had again fallen out of favour and as usual the cause was mysterious and not known even to the writer chamberlain in a letter to sir ralph winwood mentions the lady arabella's business whatsoever it was is ended and she restored to her former place and graces the king gave her a cupboard of plate better than two hundred pounds for a new year's gift and a thousand marks to pay her debts besides some yearly 
addition to her maintenance want being thought the chiefest cause of her discontentment though she be not altogether free from suspicion of being collapsed another mysterious expression which would seem to allude either to politics or religion but the fact appears by another writer to have been a discovery of a new project of marriage without the king's consent this person of her choice is not named and it was to divert her mind from the too constant object of her thoughts that james after a severe reprimand had invited her to partake of the festivities of the court in that season of revelry and reconciliation we now approach that event of the lady arabella's life which reads like a romantic fiction the catastrophe too is formed by the aristotelian canon for its misery its pathos and its terror even romantic fiction has not exceeded it is probable that the king from some political motive had decided that the lady arabella should lead a single life but such wise purposes frequently meet with cross ones and it happened that no woman was ever more solicited to the conjugal state or seems to have been so little averse to it every noble youth who sighed for distinction ambitioned the notice of the lady arabella and she was so frequently contriving a marriage for herself that a courtier of that day writing to another observes these affectations of marriage in her do give some advantage to the world of impairing the reputation of her constant and virtuous disposition the revels of christmas had hardly closed when the lady arabella forgot that she had been forgiven and again relapsed into her old infirmity she renewed a connection which had commenced in childhood with mr william seymour the second son of lord beauchamp and grandson of the earl of hertford his character has been finely described by clarendon he loved his studies and his repose but when the civil wars broke out he closed his volumes and drew his sword and was both an active and a skilful general charles i created him marquis of hertford and governor of the prince he lived to the restoration and charles the second restored him to the dukedom of somerset this treaty of marriage was detected in february sixteen o nine and the parties summoned before the privy council seymour was particularly censured for daring to ally himself with the royal blood although that blood was running in his own veins in a manuscript letter which i have discovered seymour addressed the lords of the privy council the style is humble the plea to excuse his intended marriage is that being but a young brother and sensible of mine own good unknown to the world of mean estate not born to challenge anything by my birthright and therefore my fortunes to be raised by mine own endeavour and she a lady of great honour and virtue and as i thought of great means i did plainly and honestly endeavour lawfully to gain her in marriage there is nothing romantic in this apology in which seymour describes himself as a fortune hunter which however was probably done to cover his undoubted affection for arabella whom he had early known he says that he conceived that this noble lady might without offence make the choice of any subject within this kingdom which conceit was begotten in me upon a general report after her ladyship's last being called before your lordships that it might be footnote this evidently alludes to the gentleman whose name appears not which occasioned arabella to incur the king's displeasure before christmas the lady arabella it is quite clear was resolvedly bent on marrying herself End of footnote. he tells the story of this ancient wooing i boldly intruded myself into her ladyship's chamber in the court on candlemas day last at what time i imparted my desire unto her which was entertained but with this caution on either part that both of us resolved not to proceed to any final conclusion without his majesty's most gracious favour first obtained and this was our first meeting after that we had a second meeting at briggs's house in fleet street and then a third at mr bainton's at both which we had the like conference and resolution as before he assures their lordships that both of them had never intended marriage without his majesty's approbation 
but love laughs at privy councils and the grave promises made by two frightened lovers the parties were secretly married which was discovered about july in the following year they were then separately confined the lady at the house of sir thomas parry at lambeth and seymour in the tower for his contempt in marrying a lady of the royal family without the king's leave this their first confinement was not rigorous the lady walked in her garden and the lover was a prisoner at large in the tower the writer in the biographia britannica observes that some intercourse they had by letters which after a time was discovered in this history of love these might be precious documents and in the library at long leet these love epistles or perhaps this volume may yet lie unread in a corner footnote it is on record that at longleat the seat of the marquis of bath certain papers of arabella are preserved i leave to the noble owner the pleasure of the research End of footnote. arabella's epistolary talent was not vulgar dr montford in a manuscript letter describes one of those effusions which arabella addressed to the king this letter was penned by her in the best terms as she can do right well it was often read without offence nay it was even commended by his highness with the applause of prince and council one of these amatory letters i have recovered the circumstances domestic being nothing more at first than a very pretty letter on mr seymour having taken cold but as every love-letter ought it is not without a pathetic crescendo the tearing away of hearts so firmly joined her solitary imprisonment availed little for that he lived and was her own filled her spirit with that consciousness which triumphed even over that sickly frame so nearly subdued to death the familiar style of james the first's age may bear comparison with our own i shall give it entire lady arabella to mr william seymour sir i am exceeding sorry to hear you have not been well i pray you let me know truly how you do and what was the cause of it i am not satisfied with the reason smith gives for it but if it be a cold i will impute it to some sympathy betwixt us having myself gotten a swollen cheek at the same time with a cold for god's sake let not your grief of mind work upon your body you may see by me what inconveniences it will bring one to and no fortune i assure you daunts me so much as that weakness of body i find in myself for si nous vivons l'âge d'en vaux as moreau says we may by god's grace be happier than we look for in being suffered to enjoy ourself with his majesty's favour but if we be not able to live to it i for my part shall think myself a pattern of misfortune in enjoying so great a blessing as you so little a while no separation but that deprives me of the comfort of you for wheresoever you be or in what state soever you are it sufficeth me you are mine rachel wept and would not be comforted because her children were no more and that indeed is the remediless sorrow and none else and therefore god bless us from that and i will hope well of the rest though i see no apparent hope but i am sure god's book mentioneth many of his children in as great distress that have done well after even in this world i do assure you nothing the state can do with me can trouble me so much as this news of your being ill doth and you see when i am troubled i trouble you too with tedious kindness for so i think you will account so long a letter yourself not having written to me this good while so much as how you do but sweet sir i speak not this to trouble you with writing but when you please be well and i shall account myself happy in being your faithful loving wife a r b period s period in examining the manuscripts of this lady the defective dates must be supplied by our sagacity the following petition as she calls it addressed to the king in defence of her secret marriage must have been written at this time she remonstrates with the king for what she calls his neglect of her and while she fears to be violently separated from her husband she asserts her cause with a firm and noble spirit which was afterwards too severely tried to the king may it please your most excellent majesty 
i do most heartily lament my hard fortune that i should offend your majesty the least especially in that whereby i have long desired to merit of your majesty as appeared before your majesty was my sovereign and though your majesty's neglect of me my good liking of this gentleman that is my husband and my fortune drew me to a contract before i acquainted your majesty i humbly beseech your majesty to consider how impossible it was for me to imagine it could be offensive to your majesty having few days before given me your royal consent to bestow myself on any subject of your majesty's which likewise your majesty had done long since besides never having been either prohibited any or spoken to for any in this land by your majesty these seven years that i have lived in your majesty's house i could not conceive that your majesty regarded my marriage at all whereas if your majesty had vouchsafed to tell me your mind and accept the free will offering of my obedience i would not have offended your majesty of whose gracious goodness i presume so much that if it were now as convenient in a worldly respect as malice make it seem to separate us whom god hath joined your majesty would not do evil that good might come thereof nor make me that have the honour to be so near your majesty in blood the first precedent that ever was though our princes may have left some as little imitable for so good and gracious a king as your majesty as david's dealing with uriah but i assure myself if it please your majesty in your own wisdom to consider thoroughly of my cause there will no solid reason appear to debar me of justice and your princely favour which i will endeavour to deserve whilst i breathe it is endorsed a copy of my petition to the king's majesty in another she implores that if the necessity of my state and fortune together with my weakness have caused me to do somewhat not pleasing to your majesty let it be all covered with the shadow of your royal benignity again in another petition she writes touching the offence for which i am now punished i most humbly beseech your majesty in your most princely wisdom and judgment to consider in what a miserable state i have been if i had taken any other course than i did for my own conscience witnessing before god that i was then the wife of him that now i am i could never have matched any other man but to have lived all the days of my life as a harlot which your majesty would have abhorred in any especially in one who hath the honour how otherwise unfortunate soever to have any drop of your majesty's blood in them i find the letter of lady jane drummond in reply to this or another petition which lady drummond had given the queen to present to his majesty it was to learn the cause of arabella's confinement the pithy expression of james i is characteristic of the monarch and the solemn forebodings of lady drummond who appears to have been a lady of excellent judgment showed by the fate of arabella how they were true lady jane drummond to lady arabella answering her prayer to know the cause of her confinement this day her majesty hath seen your ladyship's letter her majesty says that when she gave your ladyship's petition to his majesty he did take it well enough but gave no other answer than that ye had eaten of the forbidden tree this was all her majesty commanded me to say to your ladyship in this purpose but withal did remember her kindly to your ladyship and sent you this little token in witness of the continuance of her majesty's favour to your ladyship now where your ladyship desires me to deal openly and freely with you i protest i can say nothing on knowledge for i never spoke to any of that purpose but to the queen but the wisdom of this state with the example how some of your quality in the like case has been used makes me fear that ye shall not find so easy end to your troubles as ye expect or i wish in return lady arabella expresses her grateful thanks presents her majesty with this piece of my work to accept in remembrance of the poor prisoner that wrought them in hopes her royal hands will vouchsafe to wear them which till i have the honour to kiss i shall live in a great deal of sorrow her case she adds could be compared to no other she ever heard of resembling no other arabella like the queen of scots beguiled the hours of imprisonment by works of embroidery for in sending a present of this kind to sir andrew sinclair to be presented to the queen she thanks him for vouchsafing to descend to these petty offices to take care even of these womanish toys for her whose serious mind must invent some relaxation the secret correspondence of arabella and seymour was discovered 
and was followed by a sad scene it must have been now that the king resolved to consign this unhappy lady to the stricter care of the bishop of durham lady arabella was so subdued at this distant separation that she gave way to all the wildness of despair she fell suddenly ill and could not travel but in a litter and with a physician in her way to durham she was so greatly disquieted in the first few miles of her uneasy and troublesome journey that they would proceed no further than highgate the physician returned to town to report her state and declared that she was assuredly very weak her pulse dull and melancholy and very irregular her countenance very heavy pale and wan and though free from fever he declared her in no case fit for travel the king observed it is enough to make any sound man sick to be carried in a bed in that manner she is much more for her whose impatient and unquiet spirit heapeth upon herself far greater indisposition of body than otherwise she would have his resolution however was that she should proceed to durham if he were king we answered replied the doctor that we made no doubt of her obedience obedience is that required replied the king which being performed i will do more for her than she expected footnote these particulars i derive from the manuscript letters among the papers of arabella stuart harley manuscripts seven zero zero three in the footnote the king however with his usual indulgence appears to have consented that lady arabella should remain for a month at highgate in confinement till she had sufficiently recovered to proceed to durham where the bishop posted unaccompanied by his charge to await her reception and to the great relief of the friends of the lady who hoped she was still within the reach of their cares or of the royal favour a second month's delay was granted in consequence of that letter which we have before noticed as so impressive and so elegant that it was commended by the king and applauded by prince henry and the council but the day of her departure hastened and the lady arabella betrayed no symptom of her first despair she openly declared her resignation to her fate and showed her obedient willingness by being even over careful in little preparations to make easy a long journey such tender grief had won over the hearts of her keepers who could not but sympathize with a princess whose love holy and wedded to was crossed only by the tyranny of statesmen but arabella had not within that tranquillity with which she had lulled her keepers she and seymour had concerted a flight as bold in its plot and as beautifully wild as any recorded in romantic story the day preceding her departure arabella found it not difficult to persuade a female attendant to consent that she would suffer her to pay a last visit to her husband and to wait for her return at an appointed hour more solicitous for the happiness of lovers than for the repose of kings this attendant in utter simplicity or with generous sympathy assisted the lady arabella in dressing her in one of the most elaborate disguisings she drew a pair of large french fashioned hose or trousers over her petticoats put on a man's doublet or coat a peruke such as men wore whose long locks covered her own ringlets a black hat a black coat russet boots with red tops and a rapier by her side thus accoutred the lady arabella stole out with a gentleman about three o'clock in the afternoon she had only proceeded a mile and a half when they stopped at a poor inn where one of her confederates was waiting with horses yet she was so sick and faint that the ostler who held her stirrup observed that the gentleman could hardly hold out to london she recruited her spirits by riding the blood mantled in her face and at six o'clock our sick lover reached blackwall where a boat and servants were waiting the watermen were at first ordered to woolwich there they were desired to push on to gravesend then to tilbury where complaining of fatigue they landed to refresh but tempted by their freight they reached lee at the break of morn they discovered a french vessel riding there to receive the lady but as seymour had not yet arrived arabella was desirous to lie at anchor for her lord conscious that he would not fail to his appointment if he indeed had been prevented in his escape 
she herself cared not to preserve the freedom she now possessed but her attendants aware of the danger of being overtaken by a king's ship overruled her wishes and hoisted sail which occasioned so fatal a termination to this romantic adventure seymour indeed had escaped from the tower he had left his servant watching at the door to warn all visitors not to disturb his master who lay ill of a raging toothache while seymour in disguise stole away alone following a cart which had brought wood to his apartment he passed the warders he reached the wharf and found his confidential man waiting with a boat and he arrived at lee the time pressed the waves were rising arabella was not there but in the distance he descried a vessel hiring a fisherman to take him on board to his grief on hailing it he discovered that it was not the french vessel charged with his arabella in despair and confusion he found another ship from newcastle which for a good sum altered its course and landed him in flanders in the meanwhile the escape of arabella was first known to government and the hot alarm which spread may seem ludicrous to us the political consequences attached to the union and the flight of these two doves from their coats shook with consternation the grey owls of the cabinet more particularly the scotch party who in their terror paralleled it with the gunpowder treason and some political danger must have impended at least in their imagination for prince henry partook of this cabinet panic confusion and alarm prevailed at court couriers were dispatched swifter than the winds wafted the unhappy arabella and all was hurry in the seaports they sent to the tower to warn the lieutenant to be doubly vigilant over seymour who to his surprise discovered that his prisoner had ceased to be so for several hours james at first was for issuing a proclamation in a style so angry and vindictive that it required the moderation of cecil to preserve the dignity while he concealed the terror of his majesty by the admiral's detail of his impetuous movements he seemed in pursuit of an enemy's fleet for the courier is urged and the postmasters are roused by a superscription which warned them of the eventful dispatch haste haste post haste haste for your life your life footnote this emphatic injunction observed a friend would be effective when the messenger could read but in a letter written by the earl of essex about the year fifteen ninety seven to the lord high admiral at plymouth i have seen added to the words hast 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 for life the expressive symbol of a gallows prepared with a halter which could not be well misunderstood by the most illiterate of mercuries thus rectangle with parentheses in a line representing a hangman's rope End of footnote. the family of the seymours were in a state of distraction and a letter from mr francis seymour to his grandfather the earl of hartford residing then at his seat far remote from the capital to acquaint him of the escape of his brother and the lady still bears to posterity a remarkable evidence of the trepidation and consternation of the old earl it arrived in the middle of the night accompanied by a summons to attend the privy council in the perusal of a letter written in a small hand and filling more than two folio pages such was his agitation that in holding the taper he must have burnt what he probably had not read the letter is scorched and the flame has perforated it in so critical a part that the poor old earl journeyed to town in a state of uncertainty and confusion nor was his terror so unreasonable as it seems treason had been a political calamity with the seymours their progenitor the duke of somerset the protector had found that all his honours as franklin strangely expresses it had helped him too forwards to hop headless henry elizabeth and james says the same writer considered that it was needful as indeed in all sovereignties that those who were nearest the crown should be narrowly looked into for marriage but we have left the lady arabella alone and mournful on the seas not praying for favourable gales to convey her away but still imploring her attendants to linger for her seymour still straining her sight to the point of the horizon for some speck which might give a hope of the approach of the boat freighted with all her love alas never more was arabella to cast a single look on her lover 
and her husband she was overtaken by a pink in the king's service in calais roads and now she declared that she cared not to be brought back again to her imprisonment should seymour escape whose safety was dearest to her the life of the unhappy the melancholy and the distracted arabella stuart is now to close in an imprisonment which lasted only four years for her constitutional delicacy her rooted sorrow and the violence of her feelings sunk beneath the hopelessness of her situation and a secret resolution in her mind to refuse the aid of her physicians and to wear away the faster if she could the feeble remains of life but who shall paint the emotions of a mind which so much grief and so much love and distraction itself equally possessed what passed in that dreadful imprisonment cannot perhaps be recovered for authentic history but enough is known that her mind grew impaired that she finally lost her reason and if the duration of her imprisonment was short it was only terminated by her death Footnote lodge says she was remanded to the tower where she soon afterwards sank into helpless idiocy surviving in that wretched state till september sixteen fifteen when with miserable mockery of state she was buried in westminster abbey beside the body of henry prince of wales bishop corbett wrote some lines on her death very indicative of the poor lady's thoughts how do i thank ye death and bless thy power that i have passed the guard and scaped the tower and now my pardon is my epitaph and a small coffin my poor carcass hath for at thy charge both soul and body were enlarged at last secured from hope and fear that amongst saints this amongst kings is laid and what my birth did claim my death hath paid End of footnote. some loose effusions often begun and never ended written and erased incoherent and rational yet remain in the fragments of her papers in a letter she proposed addressing to viscount fenton to employ for her his majesty's favour again she says good my lord consider the fault cannot be uncommitted neither can any more be required of any earthly creature but confession and most humble submission in a paragraph she had written but crossed out it seems that a present of her work had been refused by the king and that she had no one about her whom she might trust help will come too late and be assured that neither physician nor other but whom i think good shall come about me while i live till i have his majesty's favour without which i desire not to live and if you remember of old i dare die so i be not guilty of my own death and oppress others with my ruin too if there be no other way as god forbid to whom i commit you and rest as assuredly as heretofore if you be the same to me your lordship's faithful friend a s that she had frequently meditated on suicide appears by another letter i could not be so unchristian as to be the cause of my own death consider what the world would conceive if i should be violently enforced to do it one fragment we may save as an evidence of her utter wretchedness in all humility the most wretched and unfortunate creature that ever lived prostrates itself at the feet of the most merciful king that ever was desiring nothing but mercy and favour not being more afflicted for anything than for the loss of that which hath been this long time the only comfort it had in the world and which if it were to do again i would not adventure the loss of for any other worldly comfort mercy it is i desire and that for god's sake such is the history of the lady arabella who from some circumstances not sufficiently open to us was an important personage designed by others at least to play a high character in the political drama thrice selected as a queen but the consciousness of royalty was only felt in her veins while she lived in the poverty of dependence many gallant spirits aspired after her hand but when her heart secretly selected one beloved it was for ever deprived of domestic happiness she is said not to have been beautiful and to have been beautiful and her very portrait ambiguous as her life is neither the one nor the other she is said to have been a poetess but not a single verse substantiates her claim to the laurel she is said not to have been remarkable for her intellectual accomplishments yet i have found a latin letter of her composition in her manuscripts the materials of her life are so scanty that it cannot be written and yet we have sufficient reason to believe that it would be as pathetic 
as it would be extraordinary could we narrate its involved incidents and paint forth her delirious feelings acquainted rather with her conduct than with her character for us the lady arabella has no palpable historical existence and we perceive rather her shadow than herself a writer of romance might render her one of those interesting personages whose griefs have been deepened by their royalty and whose adventures touched with the warm hues of love and distraction closed at the bars of her prison gate a sad example of a female victim to the state through one dim lattice fringed with ivy round successive suns a languid radiance threw to paint how fierce her angry guardian frowned to mark how fast her waning beauty flew seymour who was afterwards permitted to return distinguished himself by his loyalty through three successive reigns and retained his romantic passion for the lady of his first affections for he called the daughter he had by his second lady by the ever-beloved name of arabella stuart End of section eighty Section 81 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2 by Isaac Disraeli. Domestic History of Sir Edward Cook. Sir Edward coke or cook as now pronounced and occasionally so written in his own times that lord chief justice whose name the laws of england will preserve has shared the fate of his great rival the lord chancellor bacon for no hand worthy of their genius has pursued their story bacon busied with nature forgot himself cook who was only the greatest of lawyers reflected with more complacency on himself for among those thirty books which he had written with his own hand most pleasing to himself was a manual which he called wade makem from whence at one view he took a prospect of his life past this manuscript which lloyd notices was among the fifty which on his death were seized on by an order of council but some years after were returned to his heir and this precious memorial may still be disinterred footnote this conjecture may not be vain since this has been written i have heard that the papers of sir edward cook are still preserved at holcombe the seat of mr cook and i have also heard of others in the possession of a noble family the late mr roscoe told me that he was preparing a beautifully embellished catalogue of the holcombe library in which the taste of the owner would rival his munificence a list of those manuscripts to which i allude may be discovered in the lambeth manuscripts number nine four three article three sixty nine described in the catalogue as a note of such things as were found in a trunk of sir edward cook's by the king's command sixteen thirty four but more particularly in article three seventy one a catalogue of sir edward cook's papers then seized and brought to whitehall in the footnote cook was the oracle of law but like too many great lawyers he was so completely one as to have been nothing else cook has said the common law is the absolute perfection of all reason a dictum which might admit of some ridicule armed with law he committed acts of injustice for in how many cases passion mixing itself with law summum jus becomes summa injuria official violence brutalized and political ambition extinguished every spark of nature in this great lawyer when he struck at his victims public or domestic his solitary knowledge perhaps had deadened his judgment in other studies and yet his narrow spirit could shrink with jealousy at the celebrity obtained by more liberal pursuits than his own the errors of the great are as instructive as their virtues and the secret history of the outrageous lawyer may have at least the merit of novelty although not of panegyric cook already enriched by his first marriage combined power with added wealth in his union with the relict of sir william hatton the sister of thomas lord burleigh 
family alliance was the policy of that prudent age of political interests bacon and cecil married two sisters walsingham and mildmay two others knowles essex and leicester were linked by family alliances elizabeth who never designed to marry herself was anxious to intermarry her court dependents and to dispose of them so as to secure their services by family interests ambition and avarice which had instigated cook to form this alliance punished their creature by mating him with a spirit haughty and intractable as his own it is a remarkable fact connected with the character of cook that this great lawyer suffered his second marriage to take place in an illegal manner and condescended to plead ignorance of the laws he had been married in a private house without bans or license at a moment when the archbishop was vigilantly prosecuting informal and irregular marriages cook with his habitual pride imagined that the rank of the parties concerned would have set him above such restrictions the laws which he administered he appears to have considered had their indulgent exceptions for the great but whitgift was a primitive christian and the circumstance involved cook and the whole family in a prosecution in the ecclesiastical court and nearly in the severest of its penalties the archbishop appears to have been fully sensible of the overbearing temper of this great lawyer for when cook became the attorney-general we cannot but consider as an ingenious reprimand the archbishop's gift of a greek testament with this message that he had studied the common law long enough and should henceforward study the law of god the atmosphere of a court proved variable with so stirring a genius and as a constitutional lawyer cook at times was the stern asserter of the kingly power or its intrepid impugner but his personal dispositions led to predominance and he too often usurped authority and power with the relish of one who loved them too keenly you make the laws too much lean to your opinion whereby you show yourself to be a legal tyrant said lord bacon in his admonitory letter to cook in sixteen sixteen cook was out of favour for more causes than one and his great rival bacon was paramount at the council table footnote miss aiken's court of james i appeared two years after this article was written it has occasioned no alteration i refer the reader to her clear narrative to page thirty and page sixty three but secret history is rarely discovered in printed books End of footnote. perhaps cook felt more humiliated by appearing before his judges who were every one inferior to him as lawyers than by the weak triumph of his enemies who received him with studied insult the queen informed the king of the treatment the disgraced lord chief justice had experienced and in an angry letter james declared that he prosecuted cook ad correctionem not ad destructionem and afterwards at the council spoke of cook with so many good words as if he meant to hang him with a silken halter even his rival bacon made this memorable acknowledgment in reminding the judges that such a man was not every day to be found nor so soon made as marred when his successor was chosen the lord chancellor egerton in administering the oath accused cook of many errors and vanities for his ambitious popularity cook however lost no friends in this disgrace nor lost his haughtiness for when the new chief justice sent to purchase his collar of s s cook returned for answer that he would not part with it but leave it to his posterity that they might one day know they had a chief justice to their ancestor footnote these particulars i find in the manuscript letters of j chamberlain sloan manuscripts four one seven two sixteen sixteen in the quaint style of the times the common speech ran that lord cook had been overthrown by four p's pride prohibitions premunir and prerogative it is only with his moral quality and not with his legal controversies that his personal character is here concerned End of footnote. 
in this temporary alienation of the royal smiles cook attempted their renewal by a project which involved a domestic sacrifice when the king was in scotland and lord bacon as lord keeper sat at the head of affairs his lordship was on ill terms with secretary winwood whom cook easily persuaded to resume a former proposal for marrying his only daughter to the favourite's eldest brother sir john villiers cook had formally refused this match from the high demands of these parvenus cook in prosperity sticking at ten thousand a year and resolving to give only ten thousand marks dropped some idle words that he would not buy the king's favour too dear but now in his adversity his ambition proved stronger than his avarice and by this stroke of deep policy the wily lawyer was converting a mere domestic transaction into an affair of state which it soon became as such it was evidently perceived by bacon he was alarmed at this projected alliance in which he foresaw that he should lose his hold of the favourite in the inevitable rise once more of his rival cook bacon the illustrious philosopher whose eye was only blessed in observing nature and whose mind was only great in recording his own meditations now sat down to contrive the most subtle suggestions he could put together to prevent this match but lord bacon not only failed in persuading the king to refuse what his majesty much wished but finally produced the very mischief he sought to avert a rupture with buckingham himself and a copious scolding letter from the king but a very admirable one footnote in the lambeth manuscripts nine three six is a letter of lord bacon to the king to prevent the match between sir john villiers and mrs cook article sixty three another article sixty nine the spirited and copious letter of james to the lord keeper is printed in letters speeches charges etc of francis bacon by dr birch page one hundred and thirty three end of footnote and where the lord keeper trembled to find himself called mr bacon there were however other personages than his majesty and his favourite more deeply concerned in this business and who had not hitherto been once consulted the mother and the daughter cook who in everyday concerns issued his commands as he would his law writs and at times boldly asserted the rights of the subject had no other paternal notion of the duties of a wife and a child than their obedience lady hatton haughty to insolence had been often forbidden both the courts of their majesties where lady compton the mother of buckingham was the object of her ladyship's persevering contempt she retained her personal influence by the numerous estates which she enjoyed in right of her former husband when cook fell into disgrace his lady abandoned him and to avoid her husband frequently moved her residences in town and country i trace her with malicious activity disfurnishing his house in holborn and at stoke pogus footnote stoke pogus buckinghamshire the delightful seat of j pen esq it was the scene of gray's long story and the chimneys of the ancient house still remain to mark the locality a column on which is fixed a statue of cook erected by mr pen consecrates the former abode of its illustrious inhabitant End of footnote seizing on all the plate and movables and in fact leaving the fallen statesman and the late lord chief justice empty houses and no comforter the wars between lady hatton and her husband were carried on before the council board where her ladyship appeared accompanied by an imposing train of noble friends with her accustomed haughty airs and in an imperial style lady hatton declaimed against her tyrannical husband so that the letter writer adds divers said that burbage could not have acted better burbage's famous character was that of richard the third it is extraordinary that cook able to defend any cause bore himself so simply it is supposed that he had laid his domestic concerns too open to animadversion in the neglect of his daughter or that he was aware that he was standing before no friendly bar at that moment being out of favour whatever was the cause our noble virago obtained a signal triumph and the oracle of law with all his gravity stood before the council table henpecked 
In June 1616, Sir Edward appears to have yielded at discretion to his lady, for in an unpublished letter I find that his cursed heart hath been forced to yield to more than he ever meant. But upon this agreement he flatters himself that she will prove a very good wife. In the following year, 1617, these domestic affairs totally changed. The political marriage of his daughter with Villiers being now resolved on, the business was to clip the wings of so fierce a bird as Cook had found in Lady Hatton, which led to an extraordinary contest. The mother and daughter hated the upstart Villiers, and Sir John indeed promised to be but a sickly bridegroom they had contrived to make up a written contract of marriage with lord oxford which they opposed against the proposal or rather the order of cook the violence to which the towering spirits of the conflicting parties proceeded is a piece of secret history of which accident has preserved an able memorial cook armed with law and what was at least equally potent with the king's favor entered by force the barricadoed houses of his lady took possession of his daughter on whom he appears never to have cast a thought till she became an instrument for his political purposes confined her from her mother and at length got the haughty mother herself imprisoned and brought her to account for all her past misdoings quick was the change of scene and the contrast was as wonderful cook who in the preceding year to the world's surprise proved so simple an advocate in his own cause in the presence of his wife now to employ his own words got upon his wings again and went on as lady hatton when safely lodged in prison describes with his high-handed tyrannical courses till the furious lawyer occasioned a fit of sickness to the proud crestfallen lady law 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 thundered from the lips of its oracle and lord bacon in his apologetical letter to the king for having opposed his riot or violence says i disliked it the more because he justified it to be law which was his old song the memorial alluded to appears to have been confidentially composed by the legal friend of lady hatton to furnish her ladyship with answers when brought before the council table it opens several domestic scenes in the house of that great lord chief justice but the forcible simplicity of the style in domestic details will show what i have often observed that our language has not advanced in expression since the age of james i i have transcribed it from the original and its interest must plead for its length to lady hatton tenth july sixteen seventeen madam seeing these people speak no language but thunder and lightning accounting this their cheapest and best way to work upon you i would with patience prepare myself to their extremities and study to defend the breaches by which to their advantage they suppose to come in upon me and henceforth quit the ways of pacification and composition heretofore and unseasonably endeavoured which in my opinion lie most open to trouble scandal and danger wherefore i will briefly set down their objections and such answers to them as i conceive proper the first is you conveyed away your daughter from her father answer i had cause to provide for her quiet secretary winwood threatening that she should be married from me in spite of my teeth and sir edward cook daily tormenting the girl with discourses tending to bestow her against her liking which he said she was to submit to his besides my daughter daily complained and sought to me for help whereupon as heretofore i had, had accustomed i bestowed her apart at my cousin german's house for a few days for her health and quiet till my own business for my estate were ended sir edward cook never asked me where she was no more than at other times when at my placing she had been a quarter of a year from him as the year before with my sister burley second that you endeavoured to bestow her and to bind her to my lord of oxford without her knowledge and consent upon this subject a lawyer by way of invective may open his mouth wide and anticipate every hearer's judgment by the rights of a father this dangerous in the precedent to others 
to which nevertheless this answer may be justly returned answer my daughter as aforesaid terrified with her father's threats and hard usage and pressing me to find some remedy from this violence intended i did compassionate her condition and bethought myself of this contract to my lord of oxford if so she liked and thereupon i gave it to her to peruse and consider by herself which she did she liked it cheerfully writ it out with her own hand subscribed it and returned it to me wherein i did nothing of my own will but followed hers after i saw she was so averse to sir thomas villiers that she voluntarily and deliberately protested that of all men living she would never have him nor could ever fancy him for a husband secondly by this i put her under no new way nor into any other than her father had heretofore known and approved for he saw such letters as my lady of oxford had writ to me thereabouts he never forbade it he never disliked it only he said they were then too young and there was time enough for the treaty thirdly he always left his daughter to my disposing and my bringing up knowing that i i proposed her my fortune and whole estate and as upon these reasons he left her to my cares so he eased himself absolutely of her never meddling with her neglecting her and caring nothing for her the third that you counterfeited a treaty from my lord of oxford to yourself answer i know it not counterfeit but be it so to whose injury if to my lord of oxford's for no man else is therein interested it must be either in honour or in freehold read the treaty it proves neither for it is only a compliment it is no engagement presently nor futurely besides the law shows what forgery is and to counterfeit a private man's hand nay a magistrate's makes not the fault but the cause wherefore secondly the end justifies at the least excuses the fact for it was only to hold up my daughter's mind to her own choice and liking for her eyes only and for no others that she might see some retribution and thereby with the more constancy endure her imprisonment having this only antidote to resist the poison of that place company and conversation myself and all her friends barred from her and no person or speech admitted to her ear but such as spoke sir thomas villiers's language the fourth that you plotted to surprise your daughter to take her away by force to the breach of the king's peace and particular commandment and for that purpose had assembled a number of desperate fellows whereof the consequence might have been dangerous and the affront to the king was the greater that such a thing was offered the king being forth of the kingdom which by example might have drawn on other assemblies to more dangerous attempts this field is large for a plentiful babbler answer i know no such matter neither in any place was there such assembly true it is i spoke to turner to provide me some tall fellows for the taking a possession for me in lincolnshire of some land sir william mason had lately deceased me but be it they were assembled and convoked to such an end what was done was any such thing attempted were they upon the place kept they the heath or the highways by ambuscades or was any place any day appointed for a rendezvous no no such matter but something was intended and i pray you what says the law of such a single intention which is not within the view or notice of the law beside who intended this the mother and wherefore because she was unnaturally and barbarously secluded from her daughter and her daughter forced against her will contrary to her vow and liking to the will of him she disliked nay the laws of god of nature of man speak for me and cry out upon them but they had a warrant from the king's order from the commissioners to keep my daughter in their custody yet neither this warrant nor the commissioners did prohibit the mother coming to her but contrarily allowed her then by the same authority might she get to her daughter that sir edward cook had used to keep her from her daughter the husband having no power warrant or permission from god the king or the law to sequester the mother from her own child she only endeavouring the child's good with the child's liking and to her preferment and he his private 
end against the child's liking without care of her preferment which differing respects as they justify the mother and all so condemned they the father as a transgressor of the rules of nature and as a perverter of his rights as a father and a husband to the hurt both of child and wife lastly if recrimination could lessen the fault take this in the worst sense and naked of all the considerable circumstances it hath what is this nay what had the executing of this intention been comparatively with sir edward cook's most notorious riot committed at my lord of argyle's house when without constable or warrant associated with a dozen fellows well weaponed without cause being beforehand offered to have what he would he took down the doors of the gatehouse and of the house itself and tore the daughter in that barbarous manner from the mother and would not suffer the mother to come near her and when he was before the lords of the council to answer this outrage he justified it to make it good by law and that he feared the face of no greatness a dangerous word for the encouragement of all notorious and rebellious malefactors especially from him that had been the chief justice of the law and of the people reputed the oracle of the law and a most dangerous bravado cast in the teeth and face of the state in the king's absence and therefore most considerable for the maintenance of authority and the quiet of the land for if it be lawful for him with a dozen to enter any man's house thus outrageously for any right to which he pretends it is lawful for any man with one hundred nay with five hundred and consequently with as many as he draw together to do the same which may endanger the safety of the king's person and the peace of the kingdom the fifth that you having certified the king you had received an engagement from my lord of oxford and the king commanding you upon your allegiance to come and bring it to him or to send it him or not having it to signify his name who brought it and where he was you refused all by which you doubled and trebled a high contempt to his majesty answer i was so sick on the week before for the most part i kept my bed and even that instant i was so weak as i was not able to rise from it without help nor to endure the air which indisposition and weakness my two physicians sir william paddy and dr atkins can affirm true which so being i hope his majesty will graciously excuse the necessity and not impose a fault whereof i am not guilty and for the sending it i protest to god i had it not and for telling the parties and where he is i most humbly beseech his sacred majesty in his great wisdom and honour to consider how unworthy a part it were in me to bring any man into trouble from which i am so far from redeeming him as i can no way relieve myself and therefore humbly crave his majesty in his princely consideration of my distressed condition to forgive me this reservedness proceeding from that just sense and the rather for that the law of the land and civil causes as i am informed no way tieth me thereunto among the other papers it appears that cook accused his lady of having embezzled all his gilt and silver plate and vessel he having little in any house of mine but that his marriage with me brought him and instead thereof foisted in alchemy footnote, a term then in use for base or mixed metal end of footnote of the same sort fashion and use with the illusion to have cheated him of the other cook insists on the inventory by the schedule her ladyship says i made such plate for matter and form for my own use at purbeck that serving well enough in the country and i was loath to trust such a substance in a place so remote and in the guard of few but for the plate and vessel he saith is wanting they are every ounce within one of my three houses she complains that sir edward cook and his son clement had threatened her servant so grievously that the poor men run away to hide themselves from his fury and dared not appear abroad sir edward broke into hatton house seized upon my coach and coach horses nay my apparel which he detains thrust all my servants out of doors without wages sent down his men to corfe to inventory seize ship and carry away all the goods which being refused him by the castle-keeper 
he threats to bring your lordship's warrant for the performance thereof but your lordship established that he should have the use only of the goods during his life in such houses as the same appertained without meaning i hope of depriving me of such use being goods brought at my marriage or bought with the money i spared from my allowances stop then his high tyrannical courses for i have suffered beyond the measure of any wife mother nay of any ordinary woman in this kingdom without respect to my father my birth my fortunes with which i have so highly raised him what availed the vexation of this sick mortified and proud woman or the more tender feelings of the daughter in this forced marriage to satisfy the political ambition of the father when lord bacon wrote to the king respecting the strange behaviour of cook the king vindicated it for the purpose of obtaining his daughter blaming lord bacon for some expressions he had used and bacon with the servility of the courtier when he found the wind in his teeth tacked round and promised buckingham to promote the match he so much abhorred villiers was married to the daughter of cook at hampton court on michaelmas day sixteen seventeen cook was readmitted to the council table lady hatton was reconciled to lady compton and the queen and gave a grand entertainment on the occasion to which however the good man of the house was neither invited nor spoken of he dined that day at the temple she is still bent to pull down her husband adds my informant the moral close remains to be told lady villiers looked on her husband as the hateful object of a forced union and nearly drove him mad while she disgraced herself by such loose conduct as to be condemned to stand in a white sheet and i believe at length obtained a divorce thus a marriage projected by ambition and prosecuted by violent means closed with that utter misery to the parties with which it had commenced and for our present purpose has served to show that when a lawyer like cook holds his high-handed tyrannical courses the law of nature as well as the law of which he is the oracle will be alike violated under his roof wife and daughter were plaintiffs or defendants on whom this lord chief justice closed his ear he had blocked up the avenues to his heart with law 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 his old song beyond his eightieth year in the last parliament of charles i the extraordinary vigour of cook's intellect flamed clear under the snows of age no reconciliation ever took place between the parties on a strong report of his death her ladyship accompanied by her brother lord wimbledon posted down to stoke pogus to take possession of his mansion but beyond colebrook they met with one of his physicians coming from him with the mortifying intelligence of sir edward's amendment on which they returned at their leisure this happened in june sixteen thirty four and on the following september the venerable sage was no more End of section eighty one Section 82 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2 by Isaac Disraeli. Of Cook's Style and His Conduct. This great lawyer, perhaps, set the example of that style of railing and invective in the courts, which the egotism and craven insolence of some of our lawyers include in their practice at the bar. It may be useful to bring to recollection Cook's vituperative style in the following dialogue, so beautiful in its contrast with that of the great victim before him the attorney-general had not sufficient evidence to bring the obscure conspiracy home to raleigh with which i believe however he had cautiously tampered but cook well knew that james i had reason to dislike the hero of his age who was early engaged against the scottish interests and betrayed by the ambidextrous policy of cecil cook struck at raleigh as a sacrifice to his own political ambition as we have seen he afterwards immolated his daughter 
but his personal hatred was now sharpened by the fine genius and elegant literature of the man faculties and acquisitions the lawyer so heartily contemned cook had observed i know with whom i deal for we have to deal to-day with a man of wit cook thou art the most vile and execrable traitor that ever lived raleigh you speak indiscreetly barbarously and uncivilly cook i want words sufficient to express thy viperous treason raleigh i think you want words indeed for you have spoken one thing half a dozen times cook thou art an odious fellow thy name is hateful to all the realm of england for thy pride raleigh it will go near to prove a measuring cast between you and me mr attorney cook well i will now make it appear to the world that there never lived a viler viper upon the face of the earth than thou thou art a monster thou hast an english face but a spanish heart thou viper for i thou thee thou traitor have i angered you raleigh replied what his dauntless conduct proved i am in no case to be angry cook had used the same style with the unhappy favourite of elizabeth the earl of essex it was usual with him the bitterness was in his own heart as much as in his words and lord bacon has left among his memorandums one entitled of the abuse i received of mr attorney-general publicly in the exchequer a specimen will complete our model of his forensic oratory cook exclaimed mr bacon if you have any tooth against me pluck it out for it will do you more hurt than all the teeth in your head will do you good bacon replied the less you speak of your own greatness the more i will think of it cook replied i think scorn to stand upon terms of greatness towards you who are less than little less than the least cook was exhibited on the stage for his ill usage of raleigh as was suggested by theobald in a note on twelfth night this style of railing was long the privilege of the lawyers it was revived by judge jeffreys but the bench of judges in the reign of william and anne taught a due respect even to criminals who were not supposed to be guilty till they were convicted when cook once was himself in disgrace his high spirits sunk without a particle of magnanimity to dignify the fall his big words and his tyrannical courses when he could no longer exult that he was upon his wings again sunk with him as he presented himself on his knees to the council table among other assumptions he had styled himself lord chief justice of england when it was declared that this title was his own invention since he was no more than of the king's bench his disgrace was a thunderbolt which overthrew the haughty lawyer to the roots when the supersedious was carried to him by sir george coppin that gentleman was surprised on presenting it to see that lofty spirit shrunk into a very narrow room for cook received it with dejection and tears the writer from whose letter i have copied these words adds o tremor et suspiria non sadunt in fortem et sonstantum the same writer encloses a punning distich the name of our lord chief justice was in his day very provocative of the pun both in latin and english cicero indeed had preoccupied the miserable trifle use sondiri sosis potuit sed sondiri jura non potuit potuit sondiri jura sosis six years afterwards cook was sent to the tower and then they punned against him in english an unpublished letter of the day has this curious anecdote the room in which he was lodged in the tower had formerly been a kitchen on his entrance the lord chief justice read upon the door this room wants a cook they twitched the lion in the toils which held him shenstone had some reason in thanking heaven that his name was not susceptible of a pun this time however 
Cook was on his wings, for when Lord Arundel was sent by the king to the prisoner to inform him that he would be allowed eight of the best learned in the law to advise him for his cause, our great lawyer thanked the king, but he knew himself to be accounted to have as much skill in the law as any man in England, and therefore needed no such help nor feared to be judged by the law. End of section 82 Section 83 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2 by Isaac Disraeli. Secret History of Authors Who Have Ruined Their Booksellers aulus jellius desired to live no longer than he was able to exercise the faculty of writing he might have decently added and of finding readers this would be a fatal wish for that writer who should spread the infection of weariness without himself partaking of the epidemia the mere act and habit of writing without probably even a remote view of publication has produced an agreeable delirium and perhaps some have escaped from a gentle confinement by having cautiously concealed those voluminous reveries which remain to startle their heirs while others again have left a whole library of manuscripts out of the mere ardour of transcription collecting and copying with peculiar rapture I discovered that one of these inscribed this distich on his manuscript collection. Plura voluminibus jungenda volumina nostris. Nec mihi scribendi terminus ulus eret. Which, not to compose better verses than our original, may be translated, more volumes with our volumes still shall blend and to our writing there shall be no end but even great authors have sometimes so much indulged in the seduction of the pen that they appear to have found no substitute for the flow of their ink and the delight of stamping blank paper with their hints sketches ideas the shadows of their mind petrarch exhibits no solitary instance of this passion of the pen i read and i write night and day it is my only consolation my eyes are heavy with watching my hand is weary with writing on the table where i dine and by the side of my bed i have all the materials for writing and when i awake in the dark i write although i am unable to read the next morning what i have written petrarch was not always in his perfect senses the copiousness and the multiplicity of the writings of many authors have shown that too many find a pleasure in the act of composition which they do not communicate to others great erudition and everyday application is the calamity of that voluminous author who without good sense and what is more rare without that exquisite judgment which we call good taste is always prepared to write on any subject but at the same time on no one reasonably at the early period of printing two of the most eminent printers were ruined by the volumes of one author we have their petition to the pope to be saved from bankruptcy nicholas de lira had inveigled them to print his interminable commentary on the bible their luckless star prevailed and their warehouse groaned with eleven hundred ponderous folios as immovable as the shelves on which they for ever reposed we are astonished at the fertility and the size of our own writers of the seventeenth century when the theological war of words raged spoiling so many pages and brains they produced folio after folio like almanacs and dr owen and baxter wrote more than sixty to seventy volumes most of them of the most formidable size the truth is however that it was then easier to write up to a folio than in our days to write down to an octavo for correction selection and rejection were arts as yet unpractised they went on with their work sharply or bluntly like witless mowers without stopping to wet their scythes they were inspired by the scribbling demon of that 
rabin who in his oriental style and mania of volume exclaimed that were the heavens formed of paper and were the trees of the earth pens and if the entire sea run ink these only could suffice for the monstrous genius he was about to discharge on the world the spanish tostatus wrote three times as many leaves as the number of days he had lived and of lopa de vega it is said that this calculation came rather short we hear of another who was unhappy that his lady had produced twins from the circumstance that hitherto he had contrived to pair his labours with her own but that now he was a book behindhand i fix on four celebrated scribleri to give their secret history our prin gaspar barthius the abbe de marol and the jesuit theophilus raynaud who will all show that a book might be written on authors whose works have ruined their booksellers prin seldom dined every three or four hours he munched a manchet and refreshed his exhausted spirits with ale brought to him by his servant and when he was put into this road of writing as crabbed anthony telleth he fixed on a long quilted cap which came an inch over his eyes serving as an umbrella to defend them from too much light and then hunger nor thirst did he experience save that of his voluminous pages prin has written a library amounting i think to nearly two hundred books our unlucky author whose life was involved in authorship and his happiness no doubt in the habitual exuberance of his pen seems to have considered the being debarred from pen ink and books during his imprisonment as an act more barbarous than the loss of his ears Footnote prin was condemned for his histriomastics a book against actors and acting in which he had indulged in severe remarks on female performers and henrietta maria having frequently personated parts in court masks the offensive words were declared to have been levelled at her he was condemned to fine and imprisonment was pilloried at westminster and cheapside and had an ear cut off at each place in the footnote the extraordinary perseverance of prin in this fever of the pen appears in the following title of one of his extraordinary volumes comfortable cordials against discomfortable fears of imprisonment containing some latin verses sentences and texts of scripture written by mr william prin on his chamber walls in the tower of london during his imprisonment there translated by him into english verse sixteen forty one prin literally verified pope's description is there who locked from ink and paper scrawls with desperate charcoal round his darkened walls we have also a catalogue of printed books written by william prin esq of lincoln's inn in these classes before during and since his imprisonment with this motto you sunday acti laboris sixteen forty three the secret history of this voluminous author concludes with a characteristic event a contemporary who saw prin in the pillory at cheapside informs us that while he stood there they burnt his huge volumes under his nose which had almost suffocated him yet such was the spirit of party that a puritanic sister bequeathed a legacy to purchase all the works of prin for sion college where many still repose for by an odd fatality in the fire which happened in that library these volumes were saved from the idea that folios were the most valuable footnote prin who ultimately quarrelled with the puritans was made keeper of the records of the tower by charles the second who was advised thereto by men who did not know how else to keep busy mr prin out of political pamphleteering he went to the work of investigation with avidity and it was while so employed that he followed the mode of life narrated in the preceding page End of footnote the pleasure which authors of this stamp experience is of a nature which whenever certain unlucky circumstances combine positively debarring them from publication will not abate their ardour one jot and their pen will still luxuriate in the forbidden page which even booksellers refuse to publish many instances might be recorded but a very striking one is the case of gaspar barthius whose adversaria in two volumes folio are in the collections of the curious 
Barthius was born to literature, for Bayet has placed him among his enfants célèbres. At nine years of age he recited by heart all the comedies of Terence without missing a line. The learned admired the puerile prodigy while the prodigy was writing books before he had a beard. He became unquestionably a student of very extensive literature, modern as well as ancient. Such was his devotion to a literary life that he retreated from the busy world. It appears that his early productions were composed more carefully and judiciously than his latter ones when the passion for voluminous writing broke out, which showed itself by the usual prognostic of this dangerous disease, extreme facility of composition, and a pride and exultation in this unhappy faculty. He studied without using collections or references, trusting to his memory, which was probably an extraordinary one, though it necessarily led him into many errors in that delicate task of animadverting on other authors. Writing a very neat hand, his first copy required no transcript, and he boasts that he rarely made a correction. Everything was sent to the press in its first state. He laughs at Statius, who congratulated himself that he employed only two days in composing the epithalamium upon Stella, containing 278 hexameters. This, says Barthius, did not quite lay him open to Horace's censure of the man who made 200 verses in an hour, stands pede in uno. Not, as Barthius, but that I think the censure of Horace too hyperbolical, for I am not ignorant what it is to make a great number of verses in a short time, and in three days I translated into Latin the three first books of the Iliad, which amount to above two thousand verses. Thus rapidity and volume were the great enjoyments of this learned man's pen, and now we must look to the fruits. Barthius, on the system he had adopted, seems to have written a whole library, a circumstance which we discover by the continual references he makes in his printed works to his manuscript productions. In the Index Authorum to his Statius, he inserts his own name, to which is appended a long list of unprinted works, which Bale thinks, by their titles and extracts, conveys a very advantageous notion of them. All these, and many such as these, he generously offered the world, would any bookseller be intrepid or courteous enough to usher them from his press. But their cowardice or incivility was intractable. The truth is now to be revealed, and seems not to have been known to bail. The booksellers had been formerly so cajoled and complimented by our learned author, and had heard so much of the celebrated Barthius that they had caught at the bait, and that the two folio volumes of the much referred to Adversaria of Barthius had thus been published, but from that day no bookseller ever offered himself to publish again. The Adversaria is a collection of critical notes and quotations from ancient authors, with illustrations of their manners, customs, laws, and ceremonies. All these were to be classed into 180 books, 60 of which we possess in two volumes folio, with 11 indexes. The plan is vast as the rapidity with which it was pursued. Bale finally characterizes it by a single stroke. Its immensity tires even the imagination. But the truth is, this mighty labor turned out to be a complete failure. There was neither order nor judgment in these masses of learning, crude, obscure, and contradictory, such as we might expect from a man who trusted to his memory and would not throw away his time on any correction. His contradictions are flagrant, but one of his friends would apologize for these by telling us that, he wrote everything which offered itself to his imagination, to-day one thing, to-morrow another, in order that when he should revise it again, this contrariety of opinion might induce him to examine the subject more accurately. The notions of the friends of authors are as extravagant as those of their enemies. Barthius evidently wrote so much that often he forgot what he had written, as happened to another great bookman, one Didymus, of whom Quintilian records, that on hearing a certain history he treated it as utterly unworthy of credit, on which the teller called for one of Didymus's own books and showed where he might read it at full length. That the work failed, we have the evidence of Clement in his Bibliothèque Curieuse de Livre difficile à trouver under the article of Barthius, where we discover the winding up of the history of this book. Clement mentions more than one edition of the Adversaria. 
but on a more careful inspection he detected that the old title pages had been removed for others of a fresher date the booksellers not being able to sell the book practised this deception it availed little they remained with their unsold edition of the two first volumes of the adversaria and the author with three thousand folio sheets and manuscript while both parties complained together and their heirs could acquire nothing from the works of an author of whom bales says that his writings rise to such a prodigious bulk that one can scarce conceive a single man could be capable of executing so great a variety perhaps no copying clerk who lived to grow old amidst the dust of an office ever transcribed as much as this author has written this was the memorable fate of one of that race of writers who imagine that their capacity extends with their volume their land seems covered with fertility but in shaking their wheat no ears fall another memorable brother of this family of the scribleri is the abbe de marole who with great ardour as a man of letters and in the enjoyment of the leisure and opulence so necessary to carry on his pursuits from an entire absence of judgment closed his life with the bitter regrets of a voluminous author and yet it cannot be denied that he has contributed one precious volume to the public stock of literature a compliment which cannot be paid to some who have enjoyed a higher reputation than our author he has left us his very curious memoirs a poor writer indeed but the frankness and intrepidity of his character enable him while he is painting himself to paint man gibbon was struck by the honesty of his pen for he says in his life the dullness of michael de marolles and anthony wood footnote i cannot subscribe to the opinion that anthony wood was a dull man although he had no particular liking for works of imagination and used ordinary poets scurvily an author's personal character is often confounded with the nature of his work anthony has sallies at times to which a dull man could not be subject without the ardour of this hermit of literature where would be our literary history End of footnote acquire some value from the faithful representation of men and manners i have elsewhere shortly noticed the abbe de marolles in the character of a literary sinner but the extent of his sins never struck me so forcibly as when i observed his delinquencies counted up in chronological order in niceron's umsilustra it is extremely amusing to detect the swarming fecundity of his pen from year to year with author after author was this translator wearying others but remained himself unwearied sometimes two or three classical victims in a season were dragged into his slaughter-house of about seventy works fifty were versions of the classical writers of antiquity accompanied with notes but some odd circumstances happened to our extraordinary translator in the course of his life de l'etang a critic of that day in his regles de bien traduire drew all his examples of bad translation from our abbe who was more angry than usual and among his circle the cries of our marcias resounded de l'etang who had done this not out of malice but from urgent necessity to illustrate his principles seemed very sorry and was desirous of appeasing the angried translator one day in easter finding the abbe in church at prayers the critic fell on his knees by the side of the translator it was an extraordinary moment and a singular situation to terminate a literary quarrel you are angry with me said de l'etang and i think you have reason but this is a season of mercy and i now ask your pardon in the manner replied the abbe which you have chosen i can no longer defend myself go sir i pardon you some days after the abbe again meeting de l'etang reproached him with duping him out of a pardon which he had no desire to have bestowed on him the last reply of the critic was caustic do not be so difficult when one stands in need of a general pardon one ought surely to grant a particular one de marolles was subject to encounter critics who were never so kind as to kneel by him on an easter sunday besides these fifty translations of which the notes are often curious and even the sense may be useful to consult his love of writing produced many odd works his volumes were richly bound and freely distributed but they found no readers 
in a discours pour servir de préface sur les poètes traduit par michel de morel he has given an imposing list of illustrious persons and contemporary authors who were his friends and has preserved many singular facts concerning them he was indeed for so long a time convinced that he had struck off the true spirit of his fine originals that i find he had several times printed some critical treatise to back his last or usher in his new version giving the world reasons why the versions which had been given of that particular author soit en prose soit en vers ont été si pon approuvés jusqu'ici among these numerous translations he was the first who ventured on the dipanosophists of athenaeus which still bears an excessive price he entitles his work les quinze livres de dipanosophistes uh, d'athenae ouvrage délicieux agréablement diversifié et rempli de narrations scavant sur tout sort de matière et de sujets he has prefixed various preliminary dissertations yet not satisfied with having performed this great labour it was followed by a small quarto of forty pages which might now be considered curious analyse en description succinct des choses en continu dans les quinze livres de naipne sophiste he wrote quatrain sur les passants de la cour et les gens de lettres which the curious would now be glad to find after having plundered the classical geniuses of antiquity by his barbarous style when he had nothing more left to do he committed sacrilege in translating the bible but in the midst of printing he was suddenly stopped by authority for having inserted in his notes the reveries of the pre-adamite isaac Pevere he had already revelled on the new testament to his version of which he had prefixed so sensible an introduction that it was afterwards translated into latin translation was the mania of the abbe de Moreau. i doubt whether he ever fairly awoke out of the heavy dream of the felicity of his translations for late in life i find him observing i have employed much time in study and i have translated many books considering this rather as an innocent amusement which i have chosen for my private life than as things very necessary although they are not entirely useless some have valued them and others have cared little about them but however it may be i see nothing which obliges me to believe that they contain not at least as much good as bad both for their own matter and the form which i have given to them the notion he entertained of his translations was their closeness he was not aware of his own spiritless style and he imagined that poetry only consisted in the thoughts not in grace and harmony of verse he insisted that by giving the public his numerous translations he was not vainly multiplying books because he neither diminished nor increased their ideas in his faithful versions he had a curious notion that some were more scrupulous than they ought to be respecting translations of authors who living so many ages past are rarely read from the difficulty of understanding them and why should they imagine that a translation is injurious to them or would occasion the utter neglect of the originals we do not think so highly of our own works says the indefatigable and modest abbe but neither do i despair that they may be useful even to these scrupulous persons i will not suppress the truth while i am noticing these ungrateful labours if they have given me much pain by my assiduity they have repaid me by the fine things they have taught me and by the opinion which i have conceived that posterity more just than the present times will award a more favourable judgment thus a miserable translator terminates his long labours by drawing his bill of fame on posterity which his contemporaries will not pay but in these cases as the bill is certainly lost before it reaches acceptance why should we deprive the drawers of pleasing themselves with the ideal capital let us not however imagine that the abbe de Moreau was nothing but the man he appears in the character of a voluminous translator though occupied all his life on these miserable labours he was evidently an ingenious and nobly minded man whose days were consecrated to literary pursuits and who was among the primitive collectors in europe of fine and curious prints one of his works is a catalogue des livres des temps et des figures en taille douce paris sixteen sixty six in 
octavo in the preface our author declares that he had collected one hundred and twenty three thousand four hundred prints of six thousand masters in four hundred large volumes and one hundred and twenty small ones this magnificent collection formed by so much care and skill he presented to the king whether gratuitously given or otherwise it was an acquisition which a monarch might have thankfully accepted such was the habitual ardour of our author that afterwards he set about forming another collection of which he has also given a catalogue in sixteen seventy two in duodecimo both these catalogues of prints are of extreme rarity and are yet so highly valued by the connoisseurs that when in france i could never obtain a copy a long life may be passed without even a sight of the catalogue des livres des temps of the abbe de moreau footnote these two catalogues have always been of extreme rarity in price dr lister when at paris sixteen sixty eight notices this circumstance i have since met with them in the very curious collections of my friend mr deuce who has uniques as well as rarities the monograms of our old masters in one of these catalogues are more correct than in some later publications and the whole plan and arrangement of these catalogues of prints are peculiar and interesting End of footnote. such are the lessons drawn from this secret history of voluminous writers we see one venting his mania in scrawling on his prison walls another persisting in writing folios while the booksellers who were once caught like reynard who had lost his tail and whom no arts could any longer practise on turn away from the new trap and a third who can acquire no readers but by giving his books away growing grey and scourging the sacred genius of antiquity by his meagre versions and dying without having made up his mind whether he were as woeful a translator as some of his contemporaries had assured him among these worthies of the scribleri we may rank the jesuit theophilus reynaud once a celebrated name eulogized by bayle and patin his collected works fill twenty folios an edition indeed which finally sent the bookseller to the poor-house this enterprising bibliopolist had heard much of the prodigious erudition of the writer but he had not the sagacity to discover that other literary qualities were also required to make twenty folios at all saleable of these opera omnia perhaps not a single copy can be found in england but they may be a pennyworth on the continent reynaud's work are theological but a system of grace maintained by one work and pulled down by another has ceased to interest mankind the literature of the divine is of a less perishable nature reading and writing through a life of eighty years and giving only a quarter of an hour to his dinner with a vigorous memory and a whimsical taste for some singular subjects he could not fail to accumulate a mass of knowledge which may still be useful for the curious and besides reynaud had the ritsonian characteristic he was one of those who exemplary in their own conduct with a bitter zeal condemn whatever does not agree with their own notions and however gentle in their nature yet will set no limits to the ferocity of their pen reynaud was often in trouble with the censors of his books and much more with his adversaries so that he frequently had recourse to publishing under a fictitious name a remarkable evidence of this is the entire twentieth volume of his works it consists of the numerous writings published anonymously or to which were prefixed nom de guerre this volume is described by the whimsical title of apopompeius explained to us as the name given by the jews to the scapegoat which when loaded with all their maledictions on its head was driven away into the desert these contain all reynaud's numerous diatribes for whenever he was refuted he was always refuting he did not spare his best friends the title of a work against arnaud will show how he treated his adversaries arnoldus redivivus natus brixie sessulo duodecim renatus in galae etata nostra he dexterously applies the name of arnold by comparing him with one of the same name in the twelfth century a scholar of abelard's and a turbulent enthusiast say the romish writers who was burnt alive for having written against the luxury and the power of the priesthood and for having raised a rebellion against the pope 
when the learned de lonoy had successfully attacked the legends of saints and was called the denicheur de saint the unnicher of saints every parish priest trembled for his favourite reynaud entitled a libel on this new iconoclast hercule commodianus johannes lanoas repulsus etc he compares lanois to the emperor commodus who though the most cowardly of men conceived himself formidable when he dressed himself as hercules another of these maledictions is a tract against calvinism described as a religio bestiarum a religion of beasts because the calvinists deny free will but as he always fired with a double-barrelled gun under the cloak of attacking calvinism he aimed a deadly shot at the thomists and particularly at a dominican friar whom he considered as bad as calvin reynaud exults that he had driven one of his adversaries to take flight into scotland ad pultus scoticus transgressus to a scotch pottage an expression which st jerome used in speaking of pelagius he always rendered an adversary odious by coupling him with some odious name on one of these controversial books where sassalus refuted reynaud manoir wrote renaudus et sassalus inepti renaudo tamen sassalus ineptior the usual termination of what then passed for sense and now is the reverse i will not quit reynaud without pointing out some of his more remarkable treatises as so many curiosities of literature in a treatise on the attributes of christ he entitles a chapter christus bonus bona bonum in another on the seven branched candlestick in the jewish temple by an allegorical interpretation he explains the eucharist and adds an alphabetical list of names and epithets which have been given to this mystery the seventh volume bears the title of mariolia all the treatises have for their theme the perfections and the worship of the virgin many extraordinary things are here one is a dictionary of names given to the virgin with observations on these names another on the devotion of the scapulary and its wonderful effects written against de la noix and for which the order of the carmus when he died bestowed a solemn service and obsequies on him another of these mariolia is mentioned by galois in the journal des scavants sixteen sixty seven as a proof of his fertility having to preach on the seven solemn anthems which the church sings before christmas and which begin by an o he made this letter only the subject of his sermons and barren as the letter appears he has struck out a multitude of beautiful particulars this literary folly invites our curiosity in the eighth volume is a table of saints classed by their station condition employment and trades a list of titles and prerogatives which the councils and the fathers have attributed to the sovereign pontiff the thirteenth volume has a subject which seems much in the taste of the sermons on the letter o it is entitled laus brevitatis in praise of brevity the maxims are brief but the commentary long one of the natural subjects treated on is that of noses he reviews a great number of noses and as usual does not forget the holy virgins according to reynaud the nose of the virgin mary was long and aquiline the mark of goodness and dignity and as jesus perfectly resembled his mother he infers that he must have had such a nose a treatise entitled heteroclita spiritualia et anomala pietatis celestium terrestrium et infernorum contains many singular practices introduced into devotion which superstition ignorance and remissness have made a part of religion a treatise directed against the new custom of hiring chairs in churches and being seated during the sacrifice of the mass another on the caesarian operation which he stigmatizes as an act against nature another on eunuchs another entitled hipparchus de religioso negotiaratore is an attack on those of his own company the monk turned merchant the jesuits were then accused of commercial traffic with the revenues of their establishment the rector of a college at avignon who thought he was portrayed in this honest work confined reynaud in prison for five months the most curious work of reynaud connected with literature i possess it is entitled eratamata de malus ac bonus libris deque justa aut and justa e orandem confixione luduni sixteen fifty three 
quarto with necessary indexes one of his works having been condemned at rome he drew up these inquiries concerning good and bad books addressed to the grand inquisitor he divides his treatise into bad and nocent books bad books but not nocent books not bad but nocent books neither bad nor nocent his immense reading appears here to advantage and his ritsonian feature is prominent for he asserts that when writing against heretics all mordacity is obnoxious and an alphabetical list of abusive names which the fathers have given to the heterodox is entitled alphabetum bestiar litatis heretici ex patrum symbolis after all reynaud was a man of vast acquirement with a great flow of ideas but tasteless and void of all judgment an anecdote may be recorded of him which puts in a clear light the state of these literary men reynaud was one day pressing hard a reluctant bookseller to publish one of his works who replied write a book like father barri's and i shall be glad to print it it happened that the work of barri was pillaged from reynaud and was much liked while the original lay on the shelf however this only served to provoke a fresh attack from our redoubtable hero who vindicated his rights and emptied his quiver on him who had been ploughing with his heifer such are the writers who enjoying all the pleasures without the pains of composition have often apologized for their repeated productions by declaring that they write only for their own amusement but such private theatricals should not be brought on the public stage one catherino all his life was printing a countless number of fouille volantes in history and on antiquities each consisting of about three or four leaves in quarto l'anglais du fresnois calls him grand autour des petits livres this gentleman liked to live among antiquaries and historians but with a crooked headpiece stuck with whims and hard with knotty combinations all overloaded with prodigious erudition he could not ease it at a less rate than by an occasional dissertation of three or four quarto pages he appears to have published about two hundred pieces of this sort much sought after by the curious for their rarity brunet complains he could never discover a complete collection but catherino may escape the pains and penalties of our voluminous writers for de bure thinks he generously printed them to distribute among his friends such endless writers provided they do not print themselves into an almshouse may be allowed to print themselves out and we would accept the apology which m catherino has framed for himself which i find preserved in berry memoriae liberorum rariorum i must be allowed my freedom in my studies for i substitute my writings for a game at the tennis court or a club at the tavern i never counted among my honours these opuscula of mine but merely as harmless amusements it is my partridge as with st john the evangelist my cat as with pope st gregory my little dog as with st dominic my lamb as with st francis my great black mastiff as with cornelius agrippa and my tame hare as with eustace lipsius i have since discovered in niceron that this catherino could never get a printer and was rather compelled to study economy in his two hundred quartos of four or eight pages his paper was of inferior quality and when he could not get his dissertations into his prescribed number of pages he used to promise the end at another time which did not always happen but his greatest anxiety was to publish and spread his works in despair he adopted an odd expedient whenever m catherino came to paris he used to haunt the keys where books are sold and while he appeared to be looking over them he adroitly slided one of his own dissertations among these old books he began this mode of publication early and continued it to his last days he died with a perfect conviction that he had secured his immortality and in this manner had disposed of more than one edition of his unsaleable works niceron has given the titles of one hundred and eighteen of his things which he had looked over End of section eighty three. End of Curiosities of Literature, Volume two by Isaac Disraeli.